this testimony we were looking to have some understanding of where our municipal and state systems are most frequently connected so we have an understanding of um, just what that what that is so, okay. great so um well i can go first so so i put together just a sampling list of where municipal governments interact or interface with state website systems and um it's very big I'm sorry. having pardon this table feels really oh. big today <laughs> so um but john did basically the same thing and has a far more complete list okay so we might want to go through the details with reference to um Commissioner's list. I shouldn't call you John, sorry, the Commissioner. Secretary. Secretary, Secretary. excuse me. <laughs> yeah, sure. So I brought copies. We um, we pulled this information from our application inventory. Um, these were the, there, we, it may be missing some things that connect, but we tried to look at it from the perspective of um, what systems that we really share and where was their vulnerability, right? So, mm -hmm. um, like a tri-state fingerprinting system where if one state got infected, it, it could potentially bleed over to the other states. That's kind of the approach we took. We took. So, just because someone has access to a <coughs> website, we didn't necessarily list all of those because the list is extremely ex extensive and goes beyond just municipalities and could touch um, ordinary, you know, Vermonters or um, others. Um, we added uh, school districts or the school systems in as well. So, right. um, you know, here is the list of the things that we found uh, really intersected the most and potentially added uh, some level of security um, vulnerability or potential risk. And that's really, uh, just to be clear about at least my intention of understanding here, it's to understand where we have added or shared risk right. uh, between state and municipality or outside systems and, and understanding maybe the need to prioritize or think about those in a right. shared way. I, I think that uh, Karen's list is uh, valuable to me because it gives me um, you know, a, a different list to work from to look at those uh, sites from the uh, from Lakes of Cities and Towns perspective on the things maybe that our front and center for them on the things that they interface mm -hmm. to make sure that they're as accessible and easy to use as possible. So I think her list is going to be great for me as well, even if um, we took slightly different approaches, I think her list will be valuable. Have you had the chance to compare lists? Well, Do you know that all of yours are on here? Um, I think I haven't looked at it in great detail, but I think all of mine are in here. I okay. think the biggest ones for us are Department of Environmental Conservation and um, the the tax and the elections issues mm -hmm. those are the ones that we um, uh, spend the most okay. time on then which you might want to um, you might have some thoughts about but the municipal the beamer system but those are individuals you know like Vermont municipal employees retirement system um, so that's a little bit of a different animal I think okay and then we have things like uh, vital records where the town clerks can access the vital record system here at the state and um, load information back and forth, which, again, you know, from a ransomware type of perspective would potentially add risk if you're able to write to a system. Um, it adds additional risk. What is IPTMS? Uh, what page are you on, sir? So kind of very first under state property tax system. Plan is for the IP TMS to replace that system. Jill? And we're gonna hear from Jill. Uh, Jill Renda from the tax department. It's integrated property tax management system. We're open to better suggestions for acronyms. <laughs> is that something that's under development now or? Yes, um, we are. We I, I know I'm planning on updating we folks shortly, but it's uh, we have gone out for our request for proposals, and we've, we're currently evaluating vendors. Thank you. So as you can, as you can see from the list, I mean it's several pages, but um, state and state government and local government intersect them in many different areas. I I focused so, on the main um, okay. eight agencies and how they connect. Okay. 
And so, to understand how you broke, how this has been broken down, and it looks pretty comprehensive, at least in a big picture way. Mm -hmm. um, it's by agency. Yes. And then by individual system. Yes. So each each one of these is an individual system. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, somewhere along the line, and I think this is probably one of the uh, conferences that uh, Representative Savilli and I attended during the course of the summer, there was mention made that systems that are .gov are somewhat more secure than systems that many municipalities use that are not .gov. Does that make sense to you? It, it does. Uh, we made the transition a few years ago over to .gov. Got, got, uh, uh, before that, we were in the bt.us space, and they opened up the US space uh, mm -hmm. to a much broader audience or to a much broader uh, clientele, mm -hmm. so to speak. And so, you know, we looked at it from the standpoint of being able to mask the addresses were a little bit easier for um, uh, potential threats. So when you look at john.quinn at the old address at state.bt.us, you know, someone could have easily bought this, this space at states.bt.us or something similar to mm -hmm. that or vtt.us and uh, the .gov space um, was only for government. Um, so, you know, we made that switch at that time. Um, there was new legislation in the past couple of re weeks, and I haven't read the NACIO article, but um, about um, a, a bigger push to move uh, all government entities to the .gov space. The local as well? Local as well, because that's a, one of the issues. I, is I, have, local I haven't read the, the, board. the NACIO update yet, too. But, uh, but I'll send it to you after okay. this. And I believe that we did hear that in reference mm -hmm. to municipal governments, yep, exactly. that there was more ability to protect. Yeah, and we have some towns that, cities and towns that are on .gov, but we have quite a few that are not. Do you have, um, is there, are there best practices somewhere for municipalities regarding online presence and cybersecurity care? We have um, a, page on our website that has a lot of um, resources for local governments yes, around yes. those issues. Um, we've done a number of trainings now and we'll continue to do trainings around that. Um, and um, as I mentioned, I think at our last meeting, the, the keynote speaker at our um, annual meeting this year was a cybersecurity expert. And that actually generated a lot of new interest in, um, yes, we need to do something at the local level and, and up our game considerably. Also, we've had some, um, it's not ransomware, but the Norwich situation where there was an um, email sent, presumably from the town manager and funds transferred, that also raised people's awareness considerably, <laughs> unfortunately. so. And we have covered that um, that loss, that what the town was not able to recover in that instance. Okay. Is the perpetrator identified in that? Um, some some of the uh, bank accounts, my understanding is, were in the United States, and so they were able to track those, but not. I don't believe an actual individual, but I may not be up on the latest information about that. <clears throat> With regard to these systems, do you have a sense of uh, which ones which ones are most often used, like the volume of use? I wasn't able to pull that together in a short period of time. Okay. Um, but would you is that something that you would we, that you would know? You'd be able to we would be able to track most of that information, yeah. And similarly, um, are these ranked in any kind of order in terms of? No. Um, okay. So other questions I have are, um, is there any, uh, are, I'm sure that there are some that are, that, that uh, 
potentially have a much bigger like a, a hack into those systems would provide would be a much bigger impact. A breach of those systems would be a much bigger impact than others. Potentially, yep. Okay. And so would is that something that you would be able to share with us in the executive session? Um, yes. Okay. And are, yeah. would you be prepared to do that today, or would that be something no. you'd need to compile? Yeah, we would need okay. to compile that. I mean, there's, there's a lot that goes into, you know, the, the risk assessment, or, yeah. you know, the, to, to look at not only how many people access it, but age of system and, um, you know, potential vulnerabilities and yeah. overall network. There's, there's a lot to go through there. Okay. Well, I guess the issue is one of how when you have an inventory this large, how do you prioritize what you do? Right. And almost to the extent of adding another column and on the basis of your assessment to summarize it in terms of red, green, and yellow, right. uh, so that you know those things that pose a significant risk to at least point it out to us at, at this level without necessarily going into each and every painful detail. Yep, yep, we can, we can certainly uh, do something like that. Um, for us, you know, right now, having close to 1,400 different applications out there, you know, we're focused on the, in order to close, you know, what, what we would talk about as the five-year gap, the trajectory of expenses mm -hmm. to revenue coming into the state, one of the biggest ways ADS can help is to be able to uh, reduce the number of overall systems, which reduces the manpower that we need and builds capacity to do projects better, um, and so we've picked certain platforms, whether it be in the uh, human resources and financial space and being able to look across the enterprise and look at, you know, the, the 10 or 12 grants management systems and, you know, the three different or five different or seven different uh, financial systems that we have out there and focus on a platform that they can all go into. So bucket-like systems. One of those areas is uh, case management, as you can imagine, the state does a lot of uh, case management type of stuff, uh, constituent management type of stuff. I think we've identified like 175 just in human services, different processes and um, applications that do case management. So we're focused on building those into buckets, uh, building those into certain platforms like a Salesforce platform where you know, we can turn applications around and modernize them in eight to 12 weeks for a lot of the applications rather than doing an RFP that takes 12 to 18 months, building a one-off system that may not fit everyone's needs. We're working on the platform that everyone can still um, have a unique type of system, but we can share the data on the back end and um, reduce the number of people we need. Um, at the same time, keep the systems updated um, and when I say that, the systems, uh, those platforms are updated by the companies. So we're out of the business of having to go through these cycles of every three to five years of an expensive upgrade. So that's kind of the way we're trying to tackle the consolidation and get a handle on the number of applications that we have. Did, did the federal government, and I can't remember the, the acronym for it, create uh, a system both for federal agencies, but also uh, available to the states that modularized uh, a lot of common processes uh, run by the GSA. Uh, has a number, so they are. Does that ring a bell with you? It's not ringing a bell. I'll find it. Right. That's a lot of the, you know, frustration on the parts of the states. You know, we talk about it a lot through the National Association of State CIOs. It's, you know, if the federal government could get themselves on the same page and not throwing rocks in a glass house, but, um, you know, being able to, to use the same system across multiple areas of government. Well, that's what, this, was, that's what this program is, was designed to do, and I know it's up and running, but I, I don't know whether or not it's, it's, it's interacting, for example, with, with Vermont at all. Right. And evidently from your perspective it's not I think it depends on the I think it depends on the agency so yeah. someone like CMS um, has their own rules compared mm -hmm. to someone like um, uh, um, Department of Labor mm -hmm. is completely off on a different page mm -hmm. yeah. doing their own thing uh, they're not following the GSA rules right Secretary Quinn, so, do you have another one of these absolutely great thank you so, I, 
I would I would like to be really clear. I understand that you, the municipalities, you know, our other branches of government are all really scrambling to, you know, make sure that we are doing as much as we can as fast as we can. So I don't want to I don't want to burden with a lot of um, unnecessary or but I do think that it's important for us to have for the legislature to have a sense of which um, which systems uh, should be prioritized in terms of thinking about um, our municipalities who it seems like they may be we don't really have a good assessment but it seems like they may be pretty vulnerable mm -hmm. a lot of them um, which which ones which state systems um, are being accessed the most by our municipalities and of those systems where's the greatest risk for the biggest impact right and those could be different things the most um, used systems or the most access systems may have all the security in place that it needs right we have mm -hmm. to follow fed federal yes. regulations and compliance with mm -hmm. a lot of these systems whether it's irs 1075 compliance or some kind of hipaa compliance or social security compliance um, so when we talk about you know the access of the system the risk may be different for a system that isn't used as much, right? That may be a higher risk than, you know, our most used system. Okay. I, I do think that um, there are definitely, from the municipal point of view, definitely um, systems that we use more frequently than others. And um, for instance, listers are exchanging information on the um, tax, my VT tax system um, weekly. Uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation, the permits, notices of violation, um, complaints from folks, uh, those are get pretty high use. The Community Development Grant Program has an interactive mm -hmm. site, and so if you've mm -hmm. got those kinds of grants, you're on that site um, quite frequently. So there, there are some. And then, of course, uh, elections, which is kind of seasonal, um, but when you're using it, you're using it a fair amount. So I think, I think, Secretary Quinn, what I am trying to understand mm -hmm. is if we have a number of potentially not optimally secured um, points accessing into just if there's additional risk. Mm -hmm. Sure. I, do you, I mean, yeah. do you know that? I mean, is that something that you can? I think so. I think we can, you know, uh, formulate a assessment of some of these, of all of these things, and say, you know, whether or not it, it may it may just be on the amount of access that a town or municipality has into the system that adds additional risk. Not that uh, the system's necessarily not secure from a outside perspective but when we give someone full access to a system to be able to do something if they're infected or if they get hit with ransomware it could potentially bleed over mm -hmm. into our system if they access the system and the ransomware client gets put on our side of the wall is there equity of access to all of these systems uh, from municipalities or are there like levels levels there are levels. Yes. Okay. And is it by like position, or you know, you've got to register, or I couldn't tell you. size? It, I think it all depends on the system. Okay. The GSA thing that I was mentioning earlier is, is it seems very similar to your description of what you're doing now. It's called 18F, and it's a digital service delivery strategy, modular contracting is an acquisition strategy that we use with many of our partners and internal programs. With modular contracting, we break up large complex systems into multiple tightly scoped procurements to impact technology systems in successive interoperable uh, increments. And they have, at, at this stage, a, uh, a, a service, uh, some descriptions, and we use them. standards. So that, that, is, is what, that is something that you do. We're using them on the inter integrated eligibility okay. project. Yeah. Um, and they've helped considerably in the procurement space. Okay. That, that's where they've been really um, good positive uh, force for state government, helping us reduce the amount of time it takes to go to contract and building smaller modular deliverables for 
different projects. Mm -hmm. um, so it has been valuable in that space. Where we, where we differ, and you know, I think this always happens with technologists, yeah. um, they like us to build things from the ground up, and I hate that. <laughs> you know, I, I like to buy something and implement it. I do not like our staff to build things because I think historically we've put ourselves in a position of someone leaves and then we don't have a, way, a good way of supporting it, or mm -hmm. it's written in a way that is really hard to support. So that's where we differ, but in the procurement space, 18F has been valuable for us. There's this more actually than I, <clears throat> I thought. We need a, a little bit of time to digest and understand. Yeah, and we can we, have here. we can continue to build off from this and, and add some okay. some more clarity to the list. What do you think that we should be concerned about with this list? What do I think we should be concerned about with this list? What do you think we should worry about or know or care about with regard to this list? The legislature. Um, I, I would say, you know, given where we are, you know, we're having a challenge doing, uh, keeping track of the 1,400 applications to be completely transparent. Uh, there's so many. We have 10 security staff in total. And when you look across the enterprise, when you look at you know how we secure these things, how we do assessments of these things on a regular basis, we just can't keep up. And the number of outside systems that we share, while it's valuable from a standpoint of data and uh, reducing the overall number of systems that we would need, maybe we, we share a system that, that each municipality would have to buy if we didn't share, it, it adds it adds a lot to our plate, right? And it adds vulnerability because we don't have enough people. Um, just to be quite frank, we just, things have been built off from and just added to for so long in a decentralized way that it's gonna take a, you know, quite a few years to, to really put us in a better position. Well, one of the things about uh, risk assessment is you take a look at the risk that you face and the resources that you need to address those risks. And it becomes a balancing act of uh, can you afford to add the resources versus uh, the, the risk that you're facing in terms of the potential loss if you don't. Uh, and have you done any kind of an analysis like that? We have, um, and, and that's why I think each year um, we, we add to that analysis or we look at that analysis, and that's why each year um, that ADS has been in existence. The main area, if we have an increase in our budget, has been in the cyberspace. First, we started with visibility to the to the overall network, looking at um, our main intrusion detection points and getting some visibility through Norwich University. Last year, we expanded on that contract and added additional money to upgrade pieces of our network that were uh, failing and added vulnerability. This year, um, there's three more things that I'm proposing in the governor's budget that will further uh, reduce the amount of risk that we have based on you know, internal analysis on uh, where we see the most vulnerability based on assessments that we've done that we've talked about in executive session. But when it, when it comes to a system by system standpoint, we're doing that at the time of modernization um, or um, upgrade just because of the, the sheer number, and we do a lot of that based on prioritization of how old and what risks get involved. Yeah, that's why, as I say, with this, this inventory, which admittedly is a summary of the 1,400 systems that, that you're displaying here, uh, giving us some sort of an indication of what the priority and risk is so that we can, again, from a legislative standpoint, try to prioritize what, what we do on our right. end to, to support you. So one of the items that we're going to talk about uh, at the end of the day is uh, this memo um, that we'll be sending to committees of jurisdiction. Uh, it includes a recommendation to consider funding a third-party assessment on cybersecurity risks. I don't know if you've seen this memo. Um, I think I've seen a draft. Okay. Um, by local governments to the state systems and develop 
parameters for that assessment with um, the LCT, the Secretary of State. Um, so this information here, I think, really um, is, is relevant to that mm -hmm. point, um, both in making sure that our municipalities can access, can, can safely access state systems and that we're protected when they Uh, do we have other questions <coughs> on this topic? Okay, so at our next meeting, it would be, I, I would like it um, if you would come back with uh, as much specificity in terms of prioritization. Um, I, I don't need a comprehensive, you know, uh, I don't know what the committee would like. I am not looking for a comprehensive of each one of these, rank each one of these. Um, I'd like to know what is really in terms of um, volume and um, risk and potential impact, like where, what are the, what is rising to the top? Okay, so let me repeat what I yes. just heard. Okay. So a, a ranking of the systems based on volume and uh, risk as we see it to both state and local. Summarized down into a, a smaller list potentially of the most. Yeah, I mean that's what that is what one page. Yeah, type of document. What's about you? to fall on its face and if it does cause us huge losses of data, huge risk in terms of public safety, or the grinding to a halt of all government operations as we know. Or, Those are the ones I'd like to see at the top. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or when we're considering whether or not to do this assessment, why we should or should not. Okay. Right? Did you have a question? You're asking for specific systems as opposed to policies and strategies, right? Yes. Yes. And so if that is something that, um, I, and I would like as much specificity as possible. And so if if possible, so if that needs to be an executive session, then if if not, it would be better. But did you have a question, Senator Pearson? No. Okay. Good. That's great. Uh, and then I would note um, uh, we've been working on, and we'll be talking about later today, um, a cybersecurity class with Norwich. Uh, that is coming in, uh, hosted by FEMA and Texas a and I don't know if that information has made its way around yet, but we have, um, in addition to inviting the legislature and the judiciary, um, the LCT will be invited to attend that. And if there are open spaces, the administration will may take advantage of that as well, so. Okay, great. Thank you. Are you ready? Yes. Kind of a big break. Maybe. And do you want to be up on the screen? Though? I don't think so. I don't need a copy. I've got one of the copies. I don't have one yet. Thank you. Sure. This is not you. No. This is a little bit. So good morning, my name is Jill Remick. I'm the Director of Property Valuation and Review at the Tax Department. Um, thank you. Uh, I, my handout has Vermont Department of Taxes at the top here. And normally I'm all about projecting and avoiding paper, but um, I thought this would be helpful for me, especially to make sure I get to my points to you folks. And you know, to keep current use in business, because <laughs> for good paper. So um, the Division of Property Valuation and Review oversees um, any of the work that we do with um, the statewide education property tax. So we have a team of district advisors who are field-based, who are um, responsible for oversight and assistance to several towns. Most of them have you know, 30 to 40 towns apiece assigned to them. Um, we also implement the current use program, um, the tax increment financing portion. We work closely with VEPSI, but we oversee, um, you know, we work with the towns and oversee the implementation of that and tracking the increments. Uh, we also do railroad uh, corporate tax, uh, utility valuations, 
um, and work pretty closely with the income tax folks for homestead declarations and property tax adjustments. So basically we're the entity that um, maintains the statewide education grant list in partnership with the towns and then we work with the towns. We establish the tax rates with the Agency of Education and push those out. So um, the reason I'm here, I, I, I really appreciate you folks giving me a little bit of time. Um, I started following your group with interest last month when Karen Horn let me know that you folks were interested in, in municipal IT specifically um, because we just this summer did a survey with the LCT of towns and it's a very informal, you know, it, took, it was estimated it took about nine minutes to take. Um, but there were some good nuggets of information, so I thought that would be helpful to you folks. Um, and part of the context of why we wanted to ask some of these questions is we are um, working in earnest to replace our current grand list software program. Um, that's, the, that's the IPTMS. So we are at the very final stages of selecting a vendor for that. Um, that has currently been carried out by New England Municipal Resource Center. Um, since basically since Act 60 and Act 68 passed, that's the system that we've had in place. And it's, um, it's pretty outdated, it's pretty cumbersome to implement, you know, as, as Secretary Quinn has on his list, you know, there's file, manual file transfers that have to happen on a daily basis to get that information back and forth. Um, and it's really time that we make it a little bit more user friendly for the towns, um, that we take advantage of some of the more, you know, modern ways that we can um, use GIS integration. Um, and also last year there was some uh, negative press that Nimrick New England Municipal Resource Center got regarding their software um, or what municipalities use for things like payroll and human resources. So while it wasn't the component that we were contracted for them to do, obviously it's the same entity and that caused a great deal of concern and that just sort of helped reinforce what we were already working on which is working to really move us off of this very old platform that's very manual and very vulnerable into something much more modern so it's a little bit easier for towns to use. So that's why I thought this would just be helpful information for you folks to know. Um, so I'll just quickly read through my testimony. And then before before yeah. you do, can I ask, a, uh, so with regard to replacement of that system, is that something that has already been budgeted for and approved? Yes. Okay. And when did that happen? Um, so I think it was in the last session we got the approval. We're going to be using the computer modernization fund that we have access to. Um, so it, I think it was in the either the Budget Adjustment Act or somewhere it gave us the spending authority to do this. We've come in well under that budget. What, um, what is the budget? Uh, we were, I think we were allowed up to 10 million over five years. Okay. And we're looking at you know, half that. Um, so we currently, right now, we pay for NIMRIC out of our operating budget, the tax department. Um, you know, it's, it is very inexpensive and it's very inexpensive for towns. And I think that's part of the reason why mm -hmm. we've all sort of continued to sort of limp along and use this system because it does get the job done and we're all used to using it because we've been using it for 25 years and it's very inexpensive. Um, so that is that is part of why it's been able to just be part of our operating budget. The contract was like $120,000 a year um, for the whole, for the grantless software. So now we'll be looking at spending um, more than that per year but, but over time I think the gains in time and safety are mm -hmm. well worth it. Um, so could, could I just add, I'm sorry, sure, well maybe I'll, I'll let you get through it and then maybe you'll answer the okay. question anyway. So. I, and I normally try not to read off my paper, but I wanted to make sure I made these points to folks. I wanted to make it worth your time. Um, so just thank you for the opportunity to update you on this recent survey we did in partnership with the leading cities and towns. Like I said, this was really to collect data on the current state. Um, we really hadn't done any sort of comprehensive um, survey um, and we really just wanted to get a handle on you know, especially from our, you know, perspective, we want to make sure that whatever system we use, towns are going to be able to open up and use it on their end. Um, towns do get an annual appropriation for the grand list maintenance, uh, reappraisals, and participating in the equalization study. So there is a per parcel payment that all the towns get um, to carry out this work. Um, it hasn't changed. That figure is in statute. It's like a dollar per parcel for one of them, and I think eight fifty per parcel for the other. So um, I think there's, you know that's a possible place where we can maybe try to bring that up to today's dollars and try to get towns a little bit more funding, but that is not the position of the Department of the Administration, but that's my, you know, that's one of the things I've been trying to tout um, that we'll be talking about, because those figures have not changed. So I think, you know, <coughs> what they were asked to do 30 years ago and what the money paid for versus what towns are asked to do now is, is pretty significantly different. Um, so 
you know, uh, we did learn a lot about internet access to internet speed and IT security, and obviously um, what software and hardware that towns use varies a great deal. Um, like I said, we're embarking on this much needed upgrade for our grand list software system, which is used by the state and each municipality to state carry out the statewide education property tax system. So it was really important that we assess where our towns are at with regards to IT, but also just as important that we select a system that can meet the towns where they are and is able to support the towns and provide um, the training and um, access that, that they need um, with some of the very limited resources and um, bandwidth that towns have. Um, VLCT has definitely been a proponent of this and agreed and, and helped work with our staff to design a 16 question survey. It's very informal, like I said, I've got that, the original questions attached to the back of this um, testimony. Um, it was estimated it would take about nine minutes and it was distributed this summer. Um, it had basically four key components that it covered, internet service, internet speed, financial systems, and the grand list maintenance. Um, it's pretty impressive to note that the survey had an 83% response rate, which by surveys is excellent, and surveys of, of these folks. That shows the respect that I think the towns have for VLCT and, and interest in making sure that we knew where they were all at. Um, so this means that we heard from a great cross-section of Vermont towns, big and small. Um, we heard from listers, assessors, town clerks, treasurers, financial officers, and others. Um, the way that VLCT designed the survey, it made sure that only one response per town could come in. So, um, and a lot of these folks wear multiple hats, but I think that was also good because it didn't skew it by having you know, five people in one town take the survey and then it gives us different results. So it really is a, a pretty good representation of what the towns have. And I just wanna be really clear that we are not survey experts. You know, the way you design survey questions to get at the right answer is a skill, um, but VLCT had some, of that, had some of that expertise for sure, but it is just an informal, you know, not mandatory survey. And I'll walk you through the answers to some of the questions that we got. Um, and, um, you know, it would be helpful to do sort of a more in-depth polling either by role or by maybe system that they use. You know, this was a pretty wide net that we cast and obviously our interest was really only in the grand list maintenance and what they used um, NIMRC for. Um, so there is definitely the potential for a lot more data out there to be collected. Um, and, and also what was really interesting is VLCT was able to tell a lot about who took the survey. You could tell where they took it, um, what kind of device they used. So that was all over the map. You know, some people took it on their phone, some people took it on a PC, some people took it maybe they were on vacation in other states, um, and what browser that they used. And all these things are actually really helpful because, again, um, our number one priority with replacing the grand list software is that um, Vermont towns, no matter where they are, can use it. It's really not helpful to, um, to just grab something off the shelf if it's not going to work for the towns that have really um, slow or limited internet access, um, who may need to have things stored on a local server versus on the cloud. So this has been really helpful. Um, it's kind of fun to read some of the answers to some of the questions. You know, in some cases, they have a very professional IT system. They have a contracted um, provider with best practices. Some of them said, well, my husband comes in when I get stuck. <laughs> you know, that's their IT, <laughs> that's their IT um, support. So there's definitely a pretty huge variety in resources and expertise about IT security and infrastructure. I'm certainly learning a lot. Um, VLCT had a, their um, annual town fair. They focused purely on cybersecurity, and it was, there were was some really fascinating um, speakers and presenters that, that gave some thoughts. So pretty, pretty hard facts about how vulnerable they are um, and that really human beings continue to be the weak link, <laughs> regardless of the best system you have. If, if I stick my password on my monitor and I share the computer with three other people, or you know, I mix my work and, and personal email addresses when I'm filling out forms, I mean, there's all kinds of ways that just the human element is really still the biggest concern. So there's really a need for, for a lot of training and best practices to be more proactive, and I think that's going to be part of our role when we roll out this grandless software, is not just teaching them how to use the software, but here are some just really good basic best practices that you should try to use, just, you know, for what you can, because it's the, it's the clicking on the links, it's the sharing of, you know, things on insecure sites, it's that sort of stuff that makes people really vulnerable. Um, I'm happy to say that because what, what we're responsible for is the grand list, that's all public information. The grand list is public data. Um, so I feel a little bit a little bit more that we can breathe a little easier about this interface with the towns. Um, it's not income tax or anything like that, but the practices should be the same. 
Um, it would be helpful to do additional surveying, like I said, of either by role or you know maybe sort of focusing in on where there are places where there are um, poor internet access or towns with a much smaller population to really get a handle at what they want. I mean, Burlington, for example, has a bigger IT team than, than our building does. You know, so if there's quite a variety there. Um, and that there's just some really good best practices that individuals need to do um, about what the passwords are that they use, how they share um, computers and logins, um, how important it is to have really professional managed IT services and sort of proactive um, steps that can be taken versus, you know, I call my husband or I take a stab at it or my son comes in and helps us out. Um, and, and why and how municipal government is, is pretty particularly vulnerable. Um, so the, the information we got from the survey was helpful. We also did a listening tour this spring where we actually went around to, um, we had folks from all 14 counties, we did 11 um, meetings where we asked clerks, treasurers, listers, everyone to come in and just tell us, um, you know, what's working with the grand list software, what's not working, um, what they're afraid we're going to mess up, <laughs> tell it to us now, and also what, what they've seen or what they think could be better and what their hopes were for that. Um, and so combining with the actually getting out there in the field and talking with them about some of the problems that they face with the current system, um, and then finding out more and more about um, the need for these sort of better practices and IT services at the local level, it's helped us really focus in on the fact that the vendor that we choose really is going to have to be um, in Vermont and supporting towns and helping us get them educated. We're not going to get more staff in the tax department to do this. Um, our district advisors, there's eight of them that cover the state, um, but on top of everything else that they, they do, they'll be out there being sort of the front lines, but we really need um, support to help towns get off on the right foot. This is going to be a pretty major change. Um, this is fascinating and sort of heartening in a sense. I, I'm curious, how does the municipal property tax side of the equation, which is I'm assuming a little more still based in municipal computer systems and, and I guess I, w I would like to understand how that works and if it relates to the new system and then sort of part of that question also is income sensitivity which starts to get at some more vulnerable personal data so I don't know if I'm articulating this well but could you just just discuss that a little bit. Please. Yeah, and I'm, I, I've learned quite a bit about that. It, there's a lot of ins and outs. And like I said, because this system has been in place since Act 60 and Act 68 passed, it's all very sort of conglomed and yeah. tied together. Yeah. But the short answer is um, is that, yes, the system we provide now and the system we will provide has a municipal tax rate, basically calculator that, that the towns have their own system, whether they use their, whatever they use for their, um, you know, their grandless ledger or, or their general ledger or their, um, you know, um, administrative revenues, so on and so forth. But at some point, they, they get to the point that they actually um, use the calculator that's in the system to come up with the municipal rates. And then they can also enter, like, if it's part of a village district or if there's a veteran's exemption or other kinds of exemptions, they, they have that, and we will provide that still. Um, and then basically Does that mean that that's all housed or going to be all housed at the, on the state system, or is it duplicated? You know, for uh, for your system and also the municipal system, they could technically choose to use their own if they wanted to. But this seems pretty handy for them because then it's all in one place. And at certain points, we have to collect all that data anyway because we use the municipal tax rate information for all kinds of calculations on our end, including like the whole harmless payment for current use, and so we and for estimating property tax adjustments for the next year. Like, there's lots of reasons why we right. the GFO need that data anyway. Um, the Homestead Declaration of Property Tax Adjustment is a little different because that comes in through the VTAX, the, the, the large-scale, much more you know, sophisticated um, income tax system that we use at the tax department. So when people file their Homestead Declaration, that goes in, that's processed in the Income Tax Division, but then it creates a file that right now is uploaded and then downloaded by the town for their particular so they're merging those two data points? Yes. So, so yes, I guess I'm under, I, I, I don't feel like I have the language in some level, but I guess 
the simple way I think of it is the state system, we have a better shot at a secure system in our central system given the staff resources and expertise, which is not to say it's flawless, I understand that, compared to, you know, some of our particularly tiny towns where, you know, spouses coming in for, for IT expertise and, you know, that's sort of nerve wracking, right? And so I'm trying to understand in the new system how much of the vulnerable, the personal sort of stuff that we'd be really afraid was uh, leaked out or, or held ransom, how much of that sense of data will be centralized in the new system versus all left behind at the municipality? And, and, and maybe, you know, to the extent you question. know that, that's what I'm trying to understand. So, um, I think the, the good news is that all of the sensitive <coughs> pieces are housed in the tax on the state system already. That's part of the income tax yeah. vault <laughs> that we don't ever see, the towns don't necessarily see either. Um, they get a number, a state payment for that individual. Right. So there is the argument that if if I was a nefarious town treasurer, I could look at your income tax return, or I could look at your state adjustment and say, well, then you must make less than Figured forty-seven thousand, and therefore you're getting a, right. a circuit breaker payment. Um, but as far as where that data that actually lives about the individual social security income, anything like that, that's in that vault. That that right. is not part of what gets sent to the town. So literally, the way that I finally have been able to wrap my brain around it is when you actually look at the property tax bill, those data points are filled in by, by us yeah, okay. from this download. Um, the town doesn't see the calculations behind where that state payment came from. Um, last year, um, there was language passed that requires that the state payments for municipal um, adjustments and education adjustments are separated side by side. It used to be right. just you'd get a state payment and it could be for all or both of those, in which case it was a little bit more protective of that sort of confidential nature of low income adjustments. So now we've adjusted it so that there is a municipal state payment and an education state payment. So there was some concern at the local level that that really does say who those folks are that are getting that very specific <coughs> municipal property tax adjustment must right. be low income. Um, that's the level of that data, though. There's there's not more sensitive data than that in ours. Um, what what actually the municipalities were vulnerable about <coughs> before last year, the ones that were using the system, was their their employees' payroll and things like that. Okay. So if you're sticking that out on a server, and that's where that lives, that was where there was a vulnerability. Okay. You're saying that in the past tense. In the past tense, correct? Yes. So that's been there was a fine. They were fined by this. Uh, I think it's the Secretary of State's office okay. for that. Yeah, okay. that's yeah. But it, it helped sort of reinforce. We were already pretty well underway on the grand list, but it just sort of helped reinforce that um, this was a really good opportunity to provide towns with a better opportunity. And mm -hmm. and since this hasn't changed since the late nineties, I'm not sure how long it's going to be until we're going to change this again. A lot of folks are saying, please don't change it. I know it's not perfect, but we know how to use it. Leave it, but just as many are saying, please get me out of here. Get me out of here. <laughs> right. So, um, so yeah, it, it, it's it's tangential to what we're using it for, but not really because it was the same system. And and I think part of the reason why towns used it is because it was um, the same entity as what we were using it for for Grandless. So we do have a responsibility to respond to that. Um, so what I attached to this is just a few of the charts that just sort of show some of the big picture data points. Um, and then at the very end is the actual questions. You know, some of the questions we ask are not things that really chart well, like how satisfied are you, or um, how long does it take you to do certain things. Um, but, but um, you know, it, it talks about internet service providers, and we can provide the sort of full list of data. I really was trying to keep it high level for you folks. So we have time, Joe. Okay. Um, <laughs> we have some time here. Okay. So if you want to go through, um, just. Oh yeah, one the, more point. Commi committee. Yeah. One more point I meant to make is is that I think the combination of the um, the impact that this software that we will select has on every municipality is actually not just going to be used by a set of ten of us in the property evaluation review. It's being used by every town, and the fact that there has been this attention on cybersecurity and there was the concern last year with the current vendor, um, ADS has been very involved with us helping select the vendor. 
establish really strong requirements for mm -hmm. all of those components. Um, and also, frankly, in our new current contract with um, with the current vendor, Nimric, that has been significantly increased um, with ADS's input to make sure that so we're going to continue to use them until that's replaced. And so we really needed to make sure that we're going to continue to have them in place, that we still have to require these higher level, higher standards for security. So that, that is in place now and is going to be in place for whoever we go. Do you, given that actually you guys are buying a system that most users will not be in your department, as you said. Uh, how, how have the frontline users, have they been part of, or are they part of, or is the lead part of the selection process? I mean, I, I cringe to think that we'll get a system that you guys think is fantastic, and then municipalities know our number. They will, they will you know, yeah. and, and any of those changes is tricky, inevitable. but, but yeah, uh, so we've been, it's we've an been doing dynamic. pretty heavy road mm -hmm. show. We've, yeah. we've gone to every conference that will have us, every, okay. you know, we did do the listening tour. We also, you know, we have a monthly letter that goes out to towns and we had a, um, you know, if you can't come to the listening tour, here's what we're asking. We want your feedback. Um, but in terms of like trying software options or, or so we have them a snapshot of it. When we were rolling out the municipal users for VTAX, we had them come in as um, uh, for for user testing. We've had right. clerks, okay. treasurers, listers. They they've come in at every step of the way. Um, we actually did have um, representatives from VALA, which is the Vermont Assessors and Listers Association, and VLCT um, sit in on the demonstrations for the vendors. So they've had a pretty you know they've had and that was definitely with the goal of having their input in mind. Um, I go to every VALA meeting and talk about it. Um, like I said, we did the listening tour. There's eight pages of sort of our summary of what we heard out there. Um, I think the very broad summary is that they are very anxious for something to get better. They know that it can be better, and they want it to be better. They are very concerned about the viability of the current vendor in providing the other services they use it for if they don't get our grandma's software contract. And if that, by sort of, you know, hitting that domino, is that going to really cause a bigger problem? So whether or not we, the tax department, are responsible for what towns use for payroll and finances and things like that, the, the fact is we're paying attention and want to make sure that who we go with will, will be able to meet Nimrick where it is for all the other pieces because it, that, is, that is one of the big concerns. They know it can be better, they want it to be better, but they're worried about the ripple effect if that change. I don't Does that mean even more than I could, I'm sure, but. that NIMRIC will continue to exist and continue to serve towns for services other than the property valuation piece? Absolutely. They do reappraisal services yeah. for towns. They're kind of they, that's a huge piece. And I have to be really clear: we haven't actually selected our vendor, so it could theoretically still be NIMRIC that is selected as, as our as our vendor. Okay. Um, and then they also provide, like I said, and I think that's part of what we asked in the survey: um, provide they provide accounting. Um, uh, billing and administration, mm -hmm. so right. towns right. have the choice of who they use for those pieces. But one of the questions was about um, who they use for their financial services, and 90% use NIMRIC. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's why we have to make really sure. And, and we've actually had really great assistance from ADS. They have um, <coughs> some really phenomenal um, business analysts who are actually literally breaking apart each piece and listing what the functional requirements are, not just for our piece, but to make sure that all the pieces that towns literally need these systems to use so that there's no gray area. Because that was the big concern is, is where does the state responsibility and their system end and where does the towns begin? And we don't want to create a gap. So as much as we don't want to get into the business of trying to provide that service to towns, the reality is they're all so interconnected. And, and even to the point about the property tax bill, you know, the majority of pieces that end up in the property tax bill have at some point come through us and gone back out to the towns, but they're the ones that are responsible for billing, collecting, tracking, and then paying, making the payment. So it's all connected, so we've had to make that a pretty big priority. But yes, sorry, long answer, but yes. Jill, you said that 90% of the municipalities are using NIMRIC. Is there any commonality to the uh, 10% that are not? 
So, I'm sorry, I didn't number this. It's, it's one of the pieces in here. Um, okay. Do you want to do you want to walk us through the the, the results? Of the okay. So, we did collect um, we did collect the name and the contact information of everyone. I didn't put it in here, but um, if you are interested in knowing if your if your town participated, but like I said, 83 percent response rate, pretty good, pretty good cross section. Um, so, right, so we asked who their internet service provider was, um, and, and you know, a large number are Comcast, a lot were EC Fiber, and then there's a whole other long list of, of other providers. Um, we asked if they have a managed IT service provider for their organization. This is the, oh this my is God. the we, you know, we call the guy whatever, or, or yes we do, or we don't know. Um, but 44% said they do have a managed IT service provider, which is a good thing. Um, and then what services do they provide? So, you know, management, antivirus, upgrades, security audits, um, help desk, the 24-hour monitoring. You know, some of these numbers, like the 24-hour monitoring and resolution at 28% is, um, is apparently pretty low by industry standards. We want that to be a lot higher. Um, the antivirus installation, um, and again, I'm not an IT expert as far as cybersecurity goes, but my understanding is that um, you really need to have somebody who's sort of doing some sort of regular testing on that. You can't just take the what comes on your computer at Staples and assume that you're protected. Um, Uh, cloud services has actually been, I've, I've had to learn a lot about cloud services because a lot of the towns, you know, cloud, that's where everything's sort of going, right? Like mm -hmm. you log on to Amazon, you log on to your bank account, you log on to VTAX, you're not actually logging on to a local server. Um, but a lot of towns are concerned about their, um, either are they going to have to buy servers to host it if they don't have the internet speed available. So there may be a few cases, and these would be towns that are doing this now, that their internet s speed is, is low enough or small enough that they have to work offline and save things on their server and then when they're looking they upload it. So it yeah. again they're asking, you know, I was just at the Vermont Assessors and List Association meeting earlier this week and they again were asking about is the legislature going to continue to pay attention to getting broadband access because that is still like you know that's well, that's still very apparent on this this chart I could, of course the the issue is the 66% who don't know, right. but of those who do know, those that have internet speed uh, of 25 or more is a very small number. Right. 67, 13, oh, you're, nine. Oh, you're ahead of us. You're yeah. on. It's only about 20%. Okay. Right. 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 I, and I could foresee people actually doing it locally and then taking it home to up, upload potentially. Yes. And it has a whole nother security yes. dynamic. I've heard at least one where they take their laptop to the local gas station. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so item number nine, what the, what's the contract rate of internet speed? Um, uh, the way we got at that is there's a really simple, in the, in the, in the note that we sent out, there's a link you can click on that runs right. it, basically. I think it's Xfinity or something like that. But you can, you can run it and it tell, gives you a number that gives you that. So, so we had them tell us, we had them run it and we said, you know, what date and time were you using it? I didn't feel that was help, you know, necessarily helpful for you folks, but, you know, the time of day and the day that they did it and what their numbers were, that can also vary apparently depending on if you're doing it at a high traffic time, your, your bandwidth might be lower. You're on nine. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. That's yeah. all right. Yeah, um, the don't know is really, um, do you, right? Which is funny because we did, we sent the link that said, you know, just click on this, and I've done it, you know, yeah. I've done it at home yeah. to see if it's better in my upstairs versus downstairs. It's pretty straightforward. Um, but but a point that, that I think um, is that I've had to sort of relearn up, we don't all have to know all these things. We don't all have to become Internet experts. We don't all have to be IT security experts. The key is making sure that, they have that resource available to help them do that, not that they all become right. experts. Um, but yeah, if, if, if they don't know, then how can we design a system that they'll log into to do their grand list of work <coughs> if we don't even know if they can meet them there? Yeah. So yeah, with 66% saying they don't know, that seems like a problem. Right. 
Right. How are you going to deal with that? Well, and, and maybe it's because it's fine, so they don't, you know, because obviously more than 66% have decent internet access, but. And is this a download or upload or? Yeah, we asked that both. I think, your... I think for this one, I only did the, um, the upload speed. Okay. But we did ask both. We do have that data. Um, yeah. Um, so then, uh, six, what type of service provider do you use for these? Um, and this is, you know, getting back to, we have an IT department. Some folks use the state of Vermont. Um, plenty have a contractor or a professional managed service provider. Um, so those are good, but... Um, it would be it would be good to sort of you know the don't know not available internal support like I said maybe some of the bigger towns and cities have very robust support and that's sufficient but for a lot of places it seems like they're um, they're kind of relying on learning on the job or or um, trying to manage it themselves. I think it'd be kind of interesting to ask Secretary Quinn about these folks who the state of Vermont provides yeah. their computer security and <laughs> yeah. IT, whether he knows that or not. Yeah, yeah, I was surprised to see that. <laughs> kind of skeptical, <laughs> frankly. Um, oh, right, and then the contract rate of speed. Again, maybe that's because they're not familiar with the contract. It also depends on who filled this out. You know, it could be that the, there was a financial manager in the town uh, office. They, they know that. Um, <coughs> so here, back to the earlier question about um, on, num on let's see, sorry, number 10, what financial software systems do you use? Um, so, so the vast majority do use NIMRIC because right now that's the grand list software. We also host um, NIMRIC's CAMA software, which is how the town's actually, the town lister actually enters the data from the field and comes up with values for the property. So that's actually sort of the appraisal side of things. And then the tax billing where they can actually um, print the tax bills out of it. But you can see a lot of them use um, QuickBooks, use Peachtree, Excel, Google, other things, but the vast majority do use NIMRIC, so we want to make sure. That well, they're using multiple systems, though. Uh, right. This isn't additive. Right, and I think Peachtree might be human resources specific or something like that, or payroll. Um, so like I said, there's, there's room for more in-depth questions if What's we the want to. What's the timeline for your selection, and do you, do you have a timeline? Yeah, we, um, we hope we can announce in January. I'm I'm very okay. excited about where we're at, but it's at the point where now it's in an independent review, and it's okay. getting you know there's assessments that are being done by um, IT and finance and auditors that I'm not involved in. But we you hope you to mentioned make though change. that you thought it essential that a Vermont-based company provide the service so as to provide the the, the interaction with the municipalities, is that? I wouldn't say Vermont based, that? but that can be, that can okay. locate here, that can actually. Can have a physical presence here regardless yes, of where so. they're headquartered. Okay. Yeah, um, obviously that's not always feasible long term, but mm -hmm. at the very least for the implementation and rollout of this, mm -hmm. we, um, you know, we're not getting more tax staff who can be like the training team that goes out. We will do our best, but, mm -hmm. but someone who can, who can sort of understand meeting these folks at these different um, abilities and resources. You know, we've got quite the gamut of folks who are acting as listers and assessors in their towns who can help us do that successfully. Because there is a lot of concern, frankly, about change. Mm -hmm. And um, and there's also a lot of turnover. A lot of towns are having a hard time even finding folks. So so I think being Vermont-based alone is, is pretty narrow a, a requirement, but definitely you know, can be here physically for a period of time would be really helpful. I'm just along those lines, I'm sure you've thought of this, but I, uh, <clears throat> every time I'm in Winooski, I see the empty storefront of Optum, and they are Vermont-based by virtue of that office. I've literally never seen a single person in that office. So make sure you're talking about people on the ground as opposed to some office that is rented as you're exploring that, because I agree with you that the, the Basically, the customer support in the office is what we, what we really need, right? Trucking around to help towns sort out this new system. Right. Um, is it time for um, more in-depth polling to uh, impact 
the project, or what would you see the use of more in-depth polling? I think for the purposes of selection, I don't think I don't think so. I think we you know we we've, we've set those parameters and we know what they are and we have requirements that will be in the contract. Um, I definitely think sort of overall, not just from our small perspective, but from all these state systems and looking ahead rather than just trying to scramble with what we've got now, I think it would be very valuable for the state to really know that. You know, we pull up these maps of the state that show, you know, internet speed, and we pull up these maps that show, um, you know, connectivity, and, and but that doesn't really tell the whole picture, and what we're asking, I mean, I'm, I'm so focused on the grand list, but to look at the list that, that, that Secretary Quinn and and Karen Horn have of all the other things that right. the state works with the towns on. No wonder they get mad at us that we have them log into two different systems. They've also got ten others. So I I think it would be really valuable to actually have a a literal assessment of that. Knowing too that folks can work from their home office, they can work remotely. That's so the key is those sort of steps of what the system is and the um, password and login sort of things that people need to work smarter on. It doesn't have to be just that the town office alone has <coughs> high speed, but that the user can take that work where they, where they go and have it still be secure. And I'm sorry, I'm not like no, that's fine. That's an that's, expert that's on fine. statewide infrastructure. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to ask Karen um, if you, that same question, if you don't mind, um, you know, do you, like right off the top of your head, uh, or can you, do you see a, a use for more in-depth polling? Um, oh, we definitely do. Um, we, we think it'd be really helpful, and you know, sort of across the board to have more information and, and more accurate information. One of the, the limitations that we talked about with this uh, particular survey is who might, who answered it? And so s some folks have a lot more understanding of the whole systems than, than others at the local level. So um, the, the speed question is, is a sort of good indicator there um, of the different capabilities maybe of, of the people who are responding to the survey. So, um, and we think also in order to sort of point out where our most significant vulnerabilities are, that we're going to need to have a, a more um, robust assessment. That's going to take money to your list of recommendations. Um, I, I think we cannot do that in-house at BLCT. We, there would have to be a, um, you know, outside consultant that did that kind of survey. Thank you. <coughs> so, I think I can kind of skip some of these that are more interesting to me than anyone else. Um, but, um, you know, like number 13, if you're using that software, select the capabilities being used. So this is a great sort of representation of um, the different things that towns are using that, that interact in some capacity with the grant list. Um, and then part of the reason why 91% use it for grant list and tax billing is because that's the state provides that. That's our. They have to enter it into that. So it should be 100 percent. Um, it, it actually is 100. It actually right? is 100. At some point, it has to come in. Um, here's a great example of maybe we could ask the information differently on num number four. And I apologize, okay. you're out of order. Gosh, sure. right? um, how is the grand list data initially recorded? So the grand list is that you know every town has their property card. That's there's different um, components, acreage, grade. Um, number of so on and so forth that that they, the, the lister comes up with a value for the for the um, property and and you know how is it initially recorded manually so manually and then there's a bunch of other manually could be handwriting it but it also could be I typed it on the computer you know so the way that question was worded I think didn't give us as much because I think we were trying to get at is like I'm happy that 13% said they used a laptop or tablet that's helpful but how about the rest of them? Are they writing it on a piece of paper and then bringing it in and someone's data entering it? Do they have a way to you know, collect that data in the field so that then save them some time? Um, 
who maintains your brand list data. Obviously, the vast majority are the, um, the listers or assessors. Um, but you can see a lot of folks actually you know, wear a lot of these hats, especially in the smaller towns. The smaller the town, the more hats that individual wears. Um, which is another reason why we sort of tried to time our rollout of the software not to coincide with fall of 2020. It's the very first thing we heard from town clerks is that's going to be a crazy election year, and if you ask us to start using a different grand list software system and a different way to print property tax bills at the same time that we're managing um, an election, then that will, we would appreciate it if you didn't. So we will be spending this year building the new system testing the new system. We have um, several towns who have volunteered to be pilot towns for us, so they're actually going to be like beta testers that will use the system months ahead of everyone else so we can work out some of those kinks, and they volunteered to do that. Um, we, we said, hey, if you want to, and we continue to get towns that say they would like to be a pilot, so that we would have that, um, but then the actual sort of sw flipping the switch from one system to the other wouldn't happen until 2021. Are those pilot towns varying in size and geography yeah yep yeah, yeah i would say so um it's like i said it's voluntary but yeah there's a there's a good mix um great and also not just you know the central part of the state either all over the place but good. yeah so um i think that's a good way to do it instead of mandating or saying hey all the towns that start with a mm -hmm. you get to be our Test guinea pigs case. right um the last chart uh, the when was your last reappraisal I realize it's a little tangential to this conversation, but um, I'm glad we asked it because it also shows um, how old the grand list is getting. And I think our systems in some ways are keeping us from getting some of this stuff done. It's a lot of work. Um, we all know what happened in 20, 2008 with housing and the fact that only you know less than 100 towns, I'd say, since that time have actually done a reappraisal where they, they do the reappraisal. And, and part of the problem, honestly, is that some of the towns are having a hard time finding assessors to do the work, um, finding appraisal companies who can do town-wide appraisals. And it's especially hard for a smaller town because if you're getting paid by parcel, why would you want to bother coming into a town? So it, towns are having a hard time finding professional appraisers to come in and do their appraisals, even when they're ordered by us because their CLA has gotten so low. Um, so if we could have more robust software, we could do some sort of statistical appraisal, or we could be much more clear with the town about what's happening with their values, and we could actually audit what's happening with their values a little bit better. So we could, and maybe maybe some of those companies would be willing to come here if we had a system that they knew and could use and knew that it was a little more up to date. So totally not really connected to <laughs> anything except for my interest in the education property tax. Uh, that, um, significant amount of reappraisals that haven't been done since 2008, the effect of that would most likely be uh, CLAs over 100. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And in this past session, um, you folks passed a, a, a slightly different window. It used to be if it was 80% or below, we would require a, re a reappraisal. Now it's if it's between 85 or below 85 or above 115. So now for those ones that are on either end of that sort of extreme, where their property values have changed one way or the other, we can requ we can require a reappraisal. Um, so we will have more towns that are getting sort of flagged for being under required reappraisal. They can do their own at any time, um, but it's still we still have to make sure that there are folks out there to help towns do that work. And I think having a newer system will make it a little more appealing for folks from New Hampshire, or New York, or Massachusetts even to come up here. And and do appraisals for small Vermont towns. Okay. Yeah. I'm curious on this mark number 13. Um, this asks about the financial software capabilities. Is this, are all these capabilities going to be an option in the new package? I'm trying to get a sense of the landscape. I mean, you're. We are really trying to not take ownership over things that we are not responsible for because um, towns have absolute freedom to use whomever they want for all of this stuff except for the grant list. Um, this was helpful for us to know because we do have to make sure, especially for the tax admin um, and tax billing, that what we go with can talk to all those different systems. 
we don't need to know about accounts payable, accounts receivable, their HR benefits, their purchasing, and things like that. But our system has to talk to their system that does this, and so that's why that was helpful for us to ask. Um, Great. And then the last page is the last few pages are just the actual text of the survey completely. Mm -hmm. So um, I thought you folks might be curious to know. Um, and I think there were some questions. Obviously, you know, we actually did collect a lot more data in some of those questions. Like we actually got the names of all the different providers. We have by town the internet speed as people reported it. Um, we asked them how much they paid for what they used, um, which was helpful in some ways, you know, it ranged quite a bit, um, you know, from like $400 a year to $5,000 a year, I think is what it was, but that's all broken out. Um, and then we asked things like, how long does it take to, to enter things in the system? Right. Which is also one of those, like, I wish we, I don't know how to get at what we're trying to get at, but it was, they were like, what are you talking about? It takes forever. It depends on the, <laughs> depends on the property. Forever. Yeah, it takes a really long time. So. Um, you know, qualitative versus quantitative data. Right, right, right. But, um, but I just, I hope that was helpful and I'm happy to, I'm gonna continue to come and listen in on what you folks are doing because I do think there's a pretty strong connection between what, you know, our work and working with the towns and it's definitely felt a lot more sort of successful and positive when we're approaching it as a partnership and as a, we're all in this together rather than just saying, well, we know, because we could, we could grab all kinds of systems for the, our end of the grand list software. We could just, you know, it's, it's a database. It's basically what it is. But that's not going to cut it. We need to provide that to the towns, too. So, uh, Jill, how is the project funded, the site? Is it um, capital fund, it's general fund? Computer Modernization Fund. Oh, that's right. You said that. And I think, I think it is a administrative holdback from the property transfer tax return, maybe. It's it's a fund that the state has for infrastructure investments in IT. Um, I know that there's a, there's something related to current use that I think might also feed into the computer modernization fund. I'm sorry. We're talking about it. Yeah. Your agenda. <laughs> <laughs> Com computer modernization fund. I was asking yes, that's where this tax project is. Tax department. department. Yeah. Okay. That's so that's tax. not capital. So no, they, yeah, that's their own thing. And they've actually, anyway, they're adjusting the percentage that they keep down also. So say that again. Um, they collect some money and they keep a percentage of it. And they're actually changing that percentage. It's part of the budget discussion and part of the joint fiscal discussion that's been coming up there. Okay. Okay. And which committee, um, if any, did you, did this, uh, looked at this, um, this project? Um, a little bit the GovOps committee. Gov Ops. I mean, generally we're in ways and means a lot, but um, I think GovOps was where they were interested in this. And, it, you know, it, it's almost more sort of a, just to provide you guys some color and context. I'm not sure, you know, the action, but people will be at, contacting you regardless of, who we select right. there, we can really want it to be <laughs> successful and, and live with that. <laughs> okay. Great. Do we have any other questions? Well, I, on this? Yes. I guess I'm just still trying to understand the the uh, the Nemric, that that's what people use for payroll, is that what you said? They can. They have the choice. They can use them or something mm -hmm. else. Yeah, but they are using, 90% are using it, and that's part of the current package and so is a payroll feature going to be part of the new I, I, I'm trying to I, I just this is the theme for me is that I continue to believe we have a better shot at uh, our uh, security and that we should try to make it as easy as possible for town so I'm, I'm trying to understand it's been very thoughtful the process you're going for but as you've said you have a narrow slice of the universe that you're considering. So I'm trying to understand, are we inadvertently punting them off of a system that a lot of them are using because our package is going, the new package is going to be more narrow? Right. So the short answer is no. We only contract with NIMRIC for the grand list software and the CAMA, the computer assisted mass appraisal software. The thing is that they have a menu of services that the towns use, and so a lot of them go, yep, NIMRIC, we're going to use that for payroll, they, they HR. They add that on if you, if right. you like. Okay. 
So I don't think that, I don't know if because of the virtue of the fact that we have the contract already, if they get some sort of a discounted rate. I don't know that answer. But we don't currently contract for those. Um, we don't want to, but the concern is there that the towns that use them for their whole suite of services, right. is it going to make it harder? Is now when we go to print property tax bills so that we can start to you know, charge interest and penalties on folks that have made it, if, if, if it's not all in one system, is that going to be a problem? So that's why we're trying to get at that piece of where, where our, ours needs to talk and hand it over to whatever system they use, whether it's Mimic or Excel or QuickBooks or anything right. else. But it's, that is one of the very real risks and realities of this change. I don't think it's necessarily for the worse. I think the, the benefits outweigh the, that impact, but it's going to require us to sort of reach on where we meet them, and it's going to require the, the whoever they use for their payroll to make sure that they're, you know. But, but payroll, for example, in HR, we don't, we don't want anything to do with that data. We don't need that data that's not part of our bailiwick, but when it comes to printing property tax bills, that's where we need to make sure that we built the bridge to the right place. Could, could we ask Karen the same to sure. comment on the same yeah. sort of dynamic? Like, are we worried that the upgrade now forces everybody to have two systems? Or um, we think there'll definitely be some, uh, you know, dissatisfaction with the new system. But um, Jill and the and Pedro's worked really closely with towns on it. They're they're. They've done one of the more thorough processes that any state agency has done recently in, in you know, working out this kind of system. So I, I think that um, it may be the case that over the next few years, if a different vendor is selected for the grand list software, that you might see towns migrating their other um, financial you know, databases over to that system to be consistent. And because there are these security issues that are going to continue coming up, and um, whoever you've got handling those the, those payrolls and things has to be up to date, and, and a new vendor might have much more to offer in that respect. Well, maybe that's the question then. Does the new vendor also, to your understanding, or are you watching to see if they have a Thank commensurate you. suite of options that are not something you'll take advantage of, but the, we you know. went into that hoping we would find that sort of panacea. That has not really been the case. Okay. Property tax administration is so specific. <laughs> I think part of, frankly, why Nimrick has it is because they saw the need in Vermont and it wasn't there, and they knew that they somebody needed it. But we were hoping that there would be okay. a vent that we could say, oh, and we'll also negotiate a state contracted rate for these other services. That's the, the folks who do this work, it's pretty tailored to this because, you know, TIF and utilities, there's so many complexities to um, property valuation and, and administration that they, they don't seem to have the other. Okay. Thank you. That was wishful thinking. <laughs> we tried. Well, I'm, I'm satisfied I at least figured out my question, but. Um, so yes. I, w I would like to ask. Uh, Jill and then Karen the same question. What was the most surprising finding for you in this survey? Well, that's a good question. I was thrilled so many responded, um, which is not exactly what you're asking, but I was very happy because I think it shows that there is that need. Um, I think it definitely demonstrated the variety of abilities and expertise in this. Um, I was surprised by the, I knew that the breadth of what they used NIMRIC for was significant, but the breadth of that is really something we can't ignore. Um, I don't know that we were particularly surprised by anything because we know that it's all over the map in terms of what towns use and how they um, handle their computers. and also the speeds that are available. Just on the um, contract rate of speed for internet, if you have very slow internet, um, you might not be able to run that test at all uh, because it won't load. So um, that might be part of the 66%. Um, that's certainly the case where I am at home when I've tried to run that thing. But um, 
any, uh, anyway, I, I think we were gratified that so many people um, answered, and I think it also showed where we need a lot more specific information about what's going on out there. The one comment I remember of the IT support services, um, somebody said me. Okay, that doesn't sound great. <laughs> right. Did they say you? No, right. Or they no, said their themselves. Answer was so, me. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I call Karen Horn. <laughs> In general, I would support kind of expanding this sort of thing as far as uh, economies of scale, saving towns money, giving a, a kind of a state level suite of security and IT. Systems, uh, you know, not by any means mandating, but making it available. Um, as far as security goes, uh, you know, security vulnerabilities identified per day is in the six digits. Um, so hundreds of thousands of security vulnerabilities per day. Um, and per state? No, uh, uh, worldwide. Um, and. You know, top tier security stuff is updated every five minutes. So, if we're dealing with sensitive information, um, having somebody run in something from Best Buy is, you know, maybe five, ten years old is not the most secure. We've been getting lucky. So, I've added that uh, as a discussion item for our memo. Okay. And I don't know what. Um you know, there's a statewide procurement arrangement that BGS offers that towns and school districts can take advantage of. So they may have some of those sort of negotiated huh. rates, like for payroll and um, general ledger and things like that, that, that towns could take advantage of. One of the other things that we've learned after going through this process is we want to host an annual um, sort of showing all the different CAMA vendors, the computer system mass appraisal vendors, instead of leaving towns sort of on their own. We had been contracting with Nimric to offer that, and so a lot of the towns used that for their actual assessment. And so um, there's definitely, but towns can use whomever they want for that, and a lot of them do use other other software to come up with their actual values. So <coughs> we could we could host some sort of we could negotiate a state rate that towns could take advantage of if they wanted to, and then host some sort of a way for them to sort of see their options. Why would that be, why would, why would the towns, help me understand, be on their own on that piece? Why is it advantageous to you? Well, right now, right now they, they can use whomever they want. Um, and so it just seemed like if we can, rather than letting them sort of negotiate with these vendors on their own if we could get some sort of a state rate that they could take advantage of maybe modeling it after that bgs procurement system maybe that would be because maybe part of the concern is if you're just a small town that knows you need an assessment software where do you start how do you find out how much it costs do you really want to get into negotiating a contract maybe the state could offer some sort of a a cool just, rate you know, it seems like those things would go together well that's good right yeah. Okay. There is an argument to be made that we could require them to use the same system, and that's pretty much what other states do, but not all of them. I've yeah, heard the municipalities them. like it will be required. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Karen's forever demanding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Karen, do you have any thoughts actually on that? On why it's advantageous for the municipalities to have their choice in assessment systems? I'm sure I could bring you back some reasons off the top okay. of my head. Okay. Right. Do we have other questions on this topic? I do not. This was really uh, helpful. I'm so glad. Very thank you for uh, me. nice to know that this was done. So thank you for bringing that in. And if I, I, I would love to uh, hear more about the project as it starts going in. So we look forward to. Thank you. Okay, so. And you're ahead of schedule, and your next yes. witnesses are here and ready to go whenever you'd like. Okay, so why don't we take, um, why don't we come back at 1030 instead of 1045? Then? Is that good? Yeah. Okay. You're off the record. You are set? We're all set. Okay, so. Ready. Yeah, um, ready to go on the record. Is everybody here? 
Secretary yeah, Quinn. Get your presentation. A uh, present. Okay. It's very easy to do. You have this mouse, and everything you do here goes up on the TV. Okay. So there's your presentation. We'll put it full screen, nice. and we'll get it up there. And your. Yep, just like that. <laughs> You're on the record. Okay. Good morning. Great. Good morning. So, uh, I you are new to me. Um, if we need your names for the record, and then maybe we will uh, introduce ourselves as well. So, okay. Um, good morning, Lori Collins. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Diva, um, Executive Sponsor for MMIS and the IE and E program. Okay. Good morning. I'm Sarah Clark. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for the Agency of Human Services. And you are here today uh, to talk to us, uh, actually, sorry. Uh, uh, Chris Pearson, well, Senator from Chittenden County. Is that Chase Colchester? Randy Brock, Franklin, and part of Grand Isle. And Laura Savilli from Dover. So uh, you are here. We've been meeting. Um, I'm sure you probably know mm -hmm. this. We've been meeting regularly um, to hear about this project. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, at our last uh, at previous <coughs> meetings, we've really wanted to get a sense of um, what is the overall mm -hmm. um, picture here with regard to costs and framing, and then how things are going to be going forward. And so it looks like you've prepared some testimony. Yes. I so have. why don't we let you go through that, okay. and then uh, we will ask questions. Uh, we have uh, 45 minutes. Or we have, we have 45 minutes scheduled. I don't know if, do you have time limitations? I do not. Secretary Quinn, does your office have time limitations? We are all set. Okay. So we, uh, after this, we are with um, Becky and doing some committee discussions. So we'll have plenty of time for questions. So mm -hmm. we'll just let you go right okay. ahead. Great. So again, good morning, everybody. Um, I wanted to just start out this morning by giving you a little bit of a background. Um, on my um, history as a state employee in, at the Department of Vermont Health Access and before that, social welfare. Um, and um, this transition with Cass Madison leaving um, as of giving her notice as of October. So I have worked um, in state government for 41 years. Um, all of my time in state government has been with the Agency of Human Services in different roles. I spent 11 years as Deputy Commissioner. During that time um, as Deputy Commissioner, I was responsible for the MMIS program and project work in the Medicaid Management Information Systems program. Um, I have also launched a number of different um, programs across operations. Um, I'll mention a couple of, couple of them. I worked um, at the time with Mike Costa from the governor's office to lead the technical um, implementation of the ACO model, um, bringing in zero paid claims and encounters into the MMIS solution and paying providers differently. So the relationship with OneCare so I led that um, in 2017. We've done a number of different projects um, in the MMIS program, a number of different modules that we've implemented, and I'll go into those in my slides. Um, I bring a team approach. Um, my approach is um, focusing on teamwork, in, um, being inclusive, collaboration, communication, and support. Um, as a result, today you'll hear from a number of our team members. I work really, really closely and have been throughout the whole MMIS program and launching these projects with Secretary Quinn in, in his staff, Sarah and her staff at the Agency of um, Financial Office, and across all programs in the Agency of Human Services. Over the last three weeks, we've, um, the MMIS program and uh, myself as executive sponsor over the last three weeks um, have worked really, really hard at understanding timelines for the IE and E program, dependencies, CMS commitments. We've um, held a number of meetings with Secretary Quinn and his team 
with um, Mike Smith, the new agency secretary. We're meeting with him weekly. We're providing him updates. We have one-on-one -on -one meetings with Secretary Quinn and um, Secre Deputy Secretary Naylor. Um, and we're really trying to understand this program and um, what we need to do to move it forward. Um, our team is confident and with our abilities and commitment to work together to succeed for the good of Vermonters. And um, we really feel like our experience um, doing project work, I mean, I've been doing project work for probably 30 years. Um, we'll be able to move this forward in the way that um, has been laid out and we'll be able to meet the deadlines. So I'm gonna turn it over, well, I'm gonna start going through the slides now to give you a little more detail then about myself. So again, um, I have 35 years of experience and knowledge across all three of these programs, enrollment and eligibility, the Medicaid Management Information System, or the MMIS, and Health Information Technology. I have ex my experience has shown that teamwork, collaboration, communication, strong partnerships, and trust are all essential elements for successful completion of projects. I'm gonna employ an approach that empowers the team to make progress with clearly defined roles and responsibilities that will ensure all of our success. We're gonna rely on AHS Finance and Diva Finance for finance, um, ADS for technology and the uh, project resources, so that the folks, the humans that actually work on the projects. Um, we're gonna rely um, the program and policy staff across the Agency of Human Services will represent the business, and lastly, we'll um, rely on guidance from AOA, AHS, and DIVA for, for legal support. So now I'll um, introduce our, um, the interagency team, ADS, AHS, and DIVA. Our collective success is based on the team-based approach. The transition following Deputy Madison's resignation provided an opportunity from hearing from a handful of key team stakeholders, including myself representing the Department of Vermont Health Access, and I'll be speaking to the business. I'm going to work alongside John Zanneker, um, who's here in the audience, um, as the Deputy IAME Program Sponsor, and Joe Lizinski and I have been working for 20 years together. <coughs> and he is the deputy program lead for MMIS. He has incredibly strong relationships with the staff working on the projects, and he works very closely with our federal partner, CMS. Sarah Clark and Marie Hayward will represent AHS Finance, and Secretary John Quinn, <laughs> Darren Prail, um, and I don't think Marcia's here today, but they'll be representing ADS and speaking to technology. And Lori. Sure. Going forward, in mm -hmm. the future, who will we direct our concerns about this project to? Me. Okay. I am executive sponsor. Okay. So you will direct your concerns to me. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so now I'm going to turn it over to Sarah to talk about the, the financial picture here. Thank you. Good morning again. Thank you for the opportunity to come in and provide some additional details surrounding the financials of the IE and E project. Uh, unfortunately, I was not at your last joint meeting, um, but I did hear um, coming out of that meeting that there was a request for greater financial detail. So what you've seen in the slide right here is some high level information. I am prepared today, if you would like, or at a later point to go through some more detailed project level um, budget and financial information. Um, so let me orient you first to the chart up here. Okay. Um, this represents uh, gross spending on IE&E over three fiscal years. Fiscal year 19 are the columns shaded in green. So those reflect the budget in 19 as established in October of 2018. The second column over from that reflects what we actually spent 
um, as of June 30th of 2019 when the state fiscal year closed, as well as any encumbrances. An encumbrance would be a contractual obligation for services that were delivered in state fiscal year 19 that we couldn't pay because of timing of how the year-end close process works. And so the obligation rolls from one year to the next. I'm going to stop, and I apologize if this has already been done, um, but I'm not sure that we let folks know. We have Dan Smith from the Joint Fiscal Office who is on the phone with us, so I wanted to make sure that folks were aware of that. I apologize for not letting you know that at the beginning. Thank you. So the green columns reflect state fiscal year 19, um, and I believe the November 1st report um, that was delivered to you um, would have some of that information in there. Mm -hmm. um, then the next, the next two columns reflect the state fiscal year 20, state fiscal year 21 projections. These are um, kind of our best estimate of what we anticipate spending um, as of October of 2019. That date is kind of critical because that's when we um, are doing our work to prepare for the capital budget adjustment process. And so I just want you to know the kind of timing of the numbers that are included in this presentation today. So at a high level, state fiscal year 19, we closed under our budget as established in October of 2018 by four and a half million dollars gross. When I say gross, that means it's a mix of state and federal dollars. So um, the budget for state fiscal year 19 was 17.8 million. That was comprised 14.1 million of federal funding, 3.6 million of state funding. In this scenario, when I say state funding, I'm talking about the capital appropriations that have been established and are remaining to support the IE&E project. We spent in state fiscal year 19, from a total perspective, 13.3 million, which is comprised of $11 million of federal funding and $2.2 million of state funding. The existing, the balance in our capital appropriation at the close of state fiscal year 19, so as of June 30th, 2019, was $103,000. We are planning to, and it's assumed in these numbers, request an additional capital appropriation of $600,000 in the capital budget adjustment process that will be um, delivered to the legislature um, this winter, um, which is in line with our capital budget request from last year. If you recall, the, um, the original request from the governor included $4.5 million for state fiscal year 20, four and a half million dollars for state fiscal year 21. Um, the appropriation that eventually was made by the legislature was $4.75 million in state fiscal year 20. However, of that original appropriation, $250,000 was a set aside for the IT consultant, Dan Smith, who's on the phone. So it left four and a half million dollars for integrated eligibility in state fiscal year 20. State fiscal year 21, the appropriation in the as passed capital bill was $3.9 million, which was a $600 reduction from the governor's recommended capital bill. At the time with the legislature, the conversation was, um, if you need the funds and you demonstrate progress on your deliverables um, and a clear financial picture, we would like to have the conversation with you in the budget adjustment process. And so AHS is, a, requesting the $600,000 that would bring us back to the original request from the Capitol bill. I ask a, a question just regarding totals. Uh, one of the questions that keeps recurring is how much is integrated eligibility going to cost? Uh, is fiscal uh, 21 the last year in which you anticipate that costs will be incurred? And so if it is, then is it fair to say that the sum total cost for integrated eligibility is the sum of 13.3 million from 19, 19.2 from 20, and 16.8 for 21? So let me start with the first part of your question. And I, I may need others from the team to weigh in. But um, State Fiscal Year 21 will not be the end of the integrated um, uh, eligibility enrollment project. Um, that it is anticipated to continue beyond that. Um, 
and I should let IT experts speak, but my kind of understanding of um, technology now is that it is an ongoing process uh, of improvement. That the days where we would build a system that would last for 20 or 30 years is not kind of the realm of technology um, anymore. For the experts. Yeah. Darren, mm -hmm. I can talk for a second. Uh, Darren Prail, uh, Director of Digital Services for the Agency of Digital Services. Uh, CMS has directed us to build these giant systems um, that support the eligibility programs in a modular way, and that means mm -hmm. buying the best pieces you can to build the whole system. They're very complicated systems right. that um, have a lot of different parts, and sometimes when you buy different parts from different vendors, you get the best of uh, breed, essentially. Um, so we, and in fact, we have uh, continued to mo uh, modify and develop the existing old system concurrently uh, because you can never let these systems uh, get out of compliance or out of security um, patching or any of that. So, you, so not only do we have to build the new system and continually maintain it pretty much for the life of the system, we have to swap out the parts which we hope will be smaller parts and less costly parts over time. So uh, just to follow up on that, I mean, I, I, I understand we'll need to continue to maintain, improve, upgrade, but in terms of the original projected project, is 21 the end? Will the original projected project be I, I do not believe that that would be the end of the project. Okay. Well, I mean, the one question that, that, that we continually ask is, how much is this going to cost? So, it's a pretty simple question. And, and you could ask the same question about the existing legacy access system that we still use today on the mainframe, and it's been in uh, it, it's been in production use for over 35 years. Sure, there, there are maintenance costs, right. there sure. are adjustment costs, there are improvement costs, but in terms of getting the system, integrated eligibility as, as defined based on what the feds have asked, do we know what it's going to cost? I think until the roadmap that Lori is going to talk about is complete, we won't have that total picture. I mean, it comes back, to me, uh, it comes back to things like Vermont Health Connect. How much did Vermont Health Connect cost? It's a question I've been asking for five years, and I can't seem to get an answer. Senator John Quinn, for the record. Um, what I would say is, Kaz Madison, when she was here, she showed us a roadmap a, a couple of times of the modules that we would be doing right. each year. Um, and, and, um, I'm not remembering exactly how many. I think there were there were four projects going on this year and the next yep. year and the next year. Integrating with the MMIS program and having Lori oversee both has given us better visibility into where we can save money across the agency potentially. And so we're going through a re, re road mapping exercise to make sure that everything aligns correctly as far as the projects. A lot of work has been done over on this over the past three or four weeks. And it's been a really, really good uh, exercise, not only for AHS, but for ADS, and giving us a better vision of what that looks like in the years out. So we, we'll be able to um, give you better estimates of those pieces of work um, in future meetings. Right now, we want to make sure that we're utilizing our federal money appropriately to the best of our ability. And um, as technology changes and we build those modules in years out, that we're using the newest technologies and doing things in a way that's more sustainable than maybe you know they were three or four years ago when we started planning. Uh, I'm curious the the line about being under budget by four and a half million is that all eligible to be carried forward or does any of the federal money come with a timeline baked in? So we roughly on a six months from a federal funding perspective, roughly on a six month basis, we submit something that's called implementation advanced planning documents, IAPDs, which is essentially a grant agreement with the federal government. And so we lay out for them roughly every six months, this is our kind of planned spending over the next two years. Um, these are things that um, change as you move through projects, and I think one of the things that we'll want to talk about today is our kind of module approach um, to integrated eligibility, um, and how because of these um, smaller bites of projects, um, it allows us to be more nimble and to adjust as we, um, you know, en encounter changes along along the way, and so. Um, the funds, the 
So the, the federal funding doesn't go away, I guess is the kind of the short answer to your question, but it is something that we um, you know, kind of renew and refresh with the federal government every six months on a formal basis, but that there are weekly conversations with the federal government in terms of like the status of the projects and you know, um, how things are progressing. We'll let you keep. I, I have more questions, but kind of along the same lines as Senator Brock. But let's keep going. Sure. Do you um, want to um, go through? This is um, a spreadsheet that essentially reflects for 19, 20, and 21 by project in the IENE program um, what our kind of spending or plan spending is. I, I, it's not in the slide packet because it's a little easier to read on a larger sheet of paper, um, but we can go through that at a high level. And I'm certainly, um, you know, willing to sit down to, to, to dig in a little bit more on the whole spending on Vermont Health Connect. Um, so have you, have you, are you aware of the testimony that's been provided to this committee this summer? Um, have you had a chance to review that? In terms of timelines, that uh, it's been yes, yes, yes okay. I have yes, Great. okay, yes. Yes. Um, okay. So, giant spreadsheet. There's some extra copies if anybody would like. <laughs> um, let me orient you to the spreadsheet. So, the um, in the red column, that is the projects. Um, underneath the IE and E program. If you look at the three columns that are in green, that reflects the budget for state fiscal year 19 as of October 2018. The middle green column reflects the total actual expenditures plus the encumbrances in state fiscal year 19. And the third green column reflects the delta between budgets to actuals. When it's a negative number, it means there was underspending versus the budget that was established. The purple column is projected spending for state fiscal year 20 as of October 2019. This is our kind of roadmap, our plan for spending. The orange column is the projection for state fiscal year 21. So, at a high level, if you want to kind of maybe first talk about state fiscal year 19, um, and I, we can go through each of the projects. I don't know all the details, but I can maybe just uh, call out for you some of the like key areas of either underspending or where we overspent, which I think would be in line with the report that was submitted. You know, before you do that, yeah, maybe maybe it would be helpful if we do kind of go back to Senator Brock's uh, question. Sure. So I think we had wanted my understanding was we had really wanted to understand there was a project that was um, proposed, yeah. agreed to, and we've been building it in modules. And <clears throat> we started building it um, and funding it, mm -hmm. and then at some point we will largely be done with building the project. Mm -hmm. And so what in that frame is not on the sheet? Are there a lot of things that are not on this? So what is on here yes. is everything that we either engaged in during state fiscal year 19 or mm -hmm. plan to over 20 and 21. Okay. So if there's something beyond 21, for example, mm -hmm. um, that hasn't yet been identified or perhaps it has and it's further out in the future, it's not included on this sheet. Um, and if it's something that was completed prior to state fiscal year 19, it's not on the sheet either. And so I, I acknowledge that I, I was trying to address the questions that I heard came out of the last committee, which, which I think I've not captured here exactly. Um, because I'm, I'm understanding you want a bigger accounting to include, you know, going back to Vermont Health Connect. Well, I, I use Brock Health Connect as an example, and of course, one of the questions I have is the, is, is the question as to what extent, if any, uh, does any of the work here, in fact, replace pieces in Vermont Health Connect that were broken to begin with and have never worked? Okay. Which goes back to the question that, that I asked, the, the, the corollary question is, what did Vermont Health Connect cost? And is some of those costs, in fact, here? 
we, 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 we hear anecdotally the Vermont Health Care Act cost about $200 million. Mm -hmm. But then I see an army of temps and contractors still today doing things that that system was supposed to do that didn't do. That is an ongoing cost. And if we have in this project something that doesn't work, and we've got to do manual interventions, we've got to add contractors, we've got to add temporary staff, mm -hmm. where are those costs? Are those considered project costs, or do those become operational costs? And so there's just a lack of clarity that I have about how much is all this costing, mm -hmm. and what buckets is it in? Mm -hmm. And I will add on to that that I have found the testimony that we've gotten this summer to be helpful in terms of where we are in time with specific modules. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's been helpful. I feel like we're, okay. we're <laughs> fairly comfortable in that space. Okay. It's really the... Okay. The big picture. Yeah. Okay. That so is very murky to me. At this so point. my apologies because I definitely I, I, mm -hmm. I understood that you wanted a little bit more project level detail for kind of where we are now and where we're planning to go. Mm -hmm. I very clearly understand your question is Vermont Health Connect. What did we pay for the development of it? But also, what are we continuing to pay for the operations of Vermont Health Connect that would include perhaps some of the more manual aspects that we are continuing to engage in while we remediate. Well, um, th that's the issue, is that in terms of looking at project costs, and I, I, I apply the same thing here, and I understand there's a different development philosophy and, and certainly more control here today yes. than there was when Vermont Health Connect was done, and I acknowledge that and, and congratulate people for that. But at the same time, uh, if we have continuing costs because we built something that doesn't work, the functionality isn't there, which is still the, the legacy of Vermont Health Connect, how are those costs being accounted for? Are they part of the project? Are they operational costs? Are they in the new project? And, and it's, it's very, very murky. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I can speak to one of the projects that will, um, will help us to um, get out of the costs that we are now experiencing with Vermont Health, Health Connect. And Secretary Quinn is going to talk about the VI project and where we are with that. So the Business Intelligence Project is moving um, out of the Siebel um, database and over to um, the State of Vermont data warehouse that the ADS staff um, is building right now. So he's going to go into that project in more detail. Um, they're also building and uh, all of the operational reports that we now rely on a vendor to produce for us um, over at Vermont Health Connect. And those operational reports will be built and maintained by State of Vermont staff moving forward when the Business Intelligence Project is launched. Okay. So that will help us to start moving away from the Vermont Health Connect and to help us start saving costs. Another project that we have launched is um, electronic content management. So same kind of um, situation happened. We were relying on um, Siebel to store all of our documents in their solution. We've now moved them all over to a State of Vermont hosted on base ECM solution. So we're making um, strides at doing, replacing Vermont Health Connect and the very expensive solution that we're, um, that we're supporting right now. So we're making strides at doing that. And I think, I think you should hear us say, we would like to appreciate <laughs> those strides mm -hmm. with a little better understanding. Understood. So we're just trying to grapple with that. Understood. Yes. Is there some place that, from an accounting perspective, you've accounted for Vermont Health Connect to know how much we've spent overall as of this point? That's what I'd like to know. Yeah, uh, yes, okay. there is. Okay. I, Maybe don't, I don't have that for okay, you but yeah, today, you but yes, that there is. And I'd yes. like to know, in particular, these ongoing costs that we could, are continuing to incur, yes. are they being accounted for as part of that project, as operational costs, or as part of this project? Operational costs. And we can, we'll provide the kind of full scope um, of costs for Vermont Health Connect, how it relates to integrated eligibility, and the operating costs associated with Vermont Health Connect. Yeah, and I'd certainly like to know, as far as integrated eligibility is concerned, how much money are we spending 
in integrate, for integrated eligibility that actually is simply to replace the non-functionality that we are continuing to live with from Vermont Health Connect. Okay. Why don't you walk us through what you what you thought sure. we wanted? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And um, okay, we'll, we'll keep. We'll Great. Keep. So um, the let's see. I think I oriented you to the top. Then this is the list of. Pro, pro, it's not up on the screen, it's the um, right. this detailed sheet. So um, it is a listing of projects underneath the IE and E program. Um, if you wanted to focus on the third green column, that tells you um, off of the budget that was established in state fiscal year 19, what were the key areas of kind of underspending and overspending. But remember, this is on a state fiscal year basis, so it's not going to reflect what's the total budget for each one of these projects. This is a state fiscal year comparison. Um, and so at a high level, you could see that the IE program support underspent off of the budget by $4 million. Um, it's a pretty large bucket, the program support. Um, it reflects state staff, staff AUG, security costs. Um, when we um, have to do independent reviews on a project, which is, a, a, I believe, a legislatively required process, um, there's a lot of different costs in that bucket. We spent less than we budgeted for a whole variety of reasons, um, including um, some projects just didn't move as quickly as were originally anticipated for a variety of reasons. But because of that, our um, spending on staff AUG was less than originally anticipated in the budget. Does that mean that those are expenses that are not saved but are simply deferred and will appear later? I think um, that yes, some of those costs will be pushed into the future and are accounted for in the 20 and 21 estimates that you see on this page. So if it was something that originally maybe we intended to have done in 19 but it didn't, it's reflected in the 20 and 21. So as we go back sheet. and look at what is the total cost of this project, based on how it was originally envisioned, uh, how is that going to impact the actual cost to that budget? Because if, if it's being deferred, there aren't any savings there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that in terms of where we're, we are in terms of our forecast versus original uh, budget, original plan, that we're on target, that we're over, that we're under, are we able to to tell? So I think, and I, I'm going to let uh, IT and, and project um, folks fill in a little bit more, but so my understanding of, you know, why we're doing, one of the reasons that we're doing this module approach is so that when we take a smaller bite, um, from both a budget perspective and a, a performance perspective, that we are able to, as we move forward, if we come up with challenges, that we're able to adjust course. So that would mean both from a financial perspective as well as like, do we need to do something different to make sure that we're achieving our intended deliverable? Uh, and so in that manner, um, though when a project is delayed, it does push costs potentially into the future. Um, we're also able to uh, write uh, put ourselves on the right course so that we don't, um, and I'll say kind of maybe similar to Vermont Health Connect, so that we don't commit to uh, a solution that ultimately is not going to work for us and is going to cost us more money in the long term. Anybody would like to in beyond that? So I think Cass, or I'm positive Cass in some of her testimony talked about these you know, um, smaller projects like the consolidated paper application. So that was the first project that launched, and that was an idea of getting all of the healthcare programs into one, <coughs> one paper application. That really had nothing to do with um, with technology. That was more foundational work to get prepared for um, one of the phases of the portals. And when we come back in and talk to you more about how we plan or looked at this roadmap as we we've been again three and a half weeks into this project so we're we're still working these things out mm -hmm. like you know all of this work that's been done in this smaller chunks that has allowed us to 
um, kind of contain the project, have less risks, you know, how are we going to move it, all of these smaller projects, um, figure out what we actually need in the end, and then we have to tie it all together. And that's just a simplified kind of view of it. And that's um, what we're trying to get on a roadmap because we have commitments to our federal partner. Uh, we have commitments to you. And we have to make sure that we're meeting all of these, uh, all of these deadlines. And we end up with a solution that is going to tie things all together. Remember, they're, they're tiny little, there's phases of the customer portal. There's an ECM solution. There's a business intelligence solution. Um, there's a premium processing solution. All of these little modules, and we have to <coughs> tie it all together in what we have been calling, and I'm sure Cass has referred to, a case management solution and a worker dashboard. That comes, that comes in the out years. And we haven't yet figured out um, on our timeline how, when that will actually fit in. But we will figure it out. Do you have any sense? We do have a sense. When you will figure that out and oh. could tell us about it? Yeah, I think if you give us six weeks or so, we should have a really um, firm idea of, about that um, and how that will work. Are there new systems that are being used for the first time now that we're in open enrollment? Can you give us a snapshot of how that's going? If there are. Or are we still in the legacy? Um, well, the document uploader is being used. So that was launched and that's being used. So what that means is Vermonters can actually upload any of their verification documents that they need, even in open enrollment. And that gets um, created, it creates a PDF to the worker, and the worker will act on the change that way. As we move through this modernization in the different phases of the customer portal, um, a lot of that will no longer be a manual process, it will be an automated process. Okay. And so that's working okay? That's working fine. Do you want to keep going through? Do we have more? Do we have more? Um, go ahead. I mean, we it, we can go through each of the projects, the areas of over and under spending, um, if you want. Or there's more slides, I think. Um, so I will. I I am. So I'm looking at. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm seeing that we have different projects listed here. I was, trying to go through my notes and see, okay, wait, were these projects listed elsewhere? Um, <clears throat> so I'd love to yeah. orient myself on this sheet Yep. to the projects that we've been following. Sure. So there are more projects on the spreadsheet yes. than there are here. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think um, the intention behind these was to, this was, I don't know, maybe the more uh, pertinent updates to provide to the committee. And that's why these were um, selected um, for this executive summary level tab. But to crosswalk you quickly, if I may. So Great. the healthcare paper application yep. is uh, project C. Yep. Um, and I think a, an important when and I wasn't at the testimony, but when Cass was, I think, saying like things were over budget, she was um, reflecting on the total budget for that project. So not just from a state fiscal year perspective. So she was reflecting that things are over budget for the entirety over however many years, the time frame it takes to complete. But then when she said we finished fiscal year 19 with a $100,000 balance, I think there was some confusion perhaps about how if we're over budget in so many areas, how did we end with a, like a surplus? And I think it's because she was speaking to over budget in the context of the entire life of the project as opposed to just one state fiscal year. Yes. Which, which is what I yes. kind of managed to very tightly and we managed to each state fiscal year's appropriation yeah. um, as opposed to the life of the, and so I think, I think <coughs> that's what I'm attempting to clear up here with the spreadsheet. So the crosswalk healthcare paper app is 
is C. Yep. Enterprise content management is D yep. on the spreadsheet. Business intelligence is H. Yes. Document uploader is E. CMS mitigation items um, is not actually on the spreadsheet that I've handed out because I believe those items are factored into the DIVA operating budget. And so it's not what I'm presenting to you here has to do with the design development implementation of IE&E as opposed to the operating costs. So that's not reflected on my spreadsheet. So this spreadsheet are for the design elements, yep. not operational. Okay. The online application is F on my spreadsheet. And premium processing is K on my spreadsheet. And I can, um, if it's helpful, maybe we can just resubmit this table with the kind of crosswalk to the, if that's helpful. Um, sure. So there's a lot <laughs> that is on your spreadsheet that <clears throat> Have we seen this? Have we seen reporting on these other um, columns? I, I'm feeling Do you like want to ask Dan. Dan, have we seen? I don't know if you're. I don't. He doesn't have the spreadsheet. So, uh, <clears throat> Dan, we are looking at um, line items for IE program support, AHS independent verification and validation. Uh, the, there's no funding for the customer portal phase three. So I so I should say so I yes. should I should clarify. So okay. some of them on this spreadsheet are actually projects that are are wouldn't be here because they haven't started yet, right? Mm -hmm. They're a state fiscal year twenty or state fiscal year twenty one, and They're so package, right? yes, mm -hmm. yeah, great. So it's this is from last. This is last. Yeah, so it's a it's a timing thing. Um, and then uh, some of the other um, items that are highlighted have to do more with, I, like uh, I'll point you to um, M on the spreadsheet, government procurement. That has to do, it's the contract with 18F, which is basically, um, the, it's a part of the General Services Administration of the federal government that we have a contract with that has been working with the state to kind of design our overall procurement strategy for IE&E. And, e. and so- It's the modular. Yes, yeah. and so, yeah, and yeah. so, so that's it. It, it does. I, I, Dan, I think he can't hear. I think he has seen. I don't think he would be surprised by any of this. Okay, uh, but we can send it to him and we can confirm that. Okay, I'm going to scare it to post. Okay. okay, okay, thank you. Great. So, yes, sir. just uh, one of the things that stands out from the old uh, exchange days is the change of circumstance. So, I think to Senator Brock's question. Mm -hmm. I mean, since very day one of launching the exchange, we have been challenged by the change of circumstance. It's, it's never worked. It's had a lot of attempts to have a workaround. And so is, is that the same one? Is that the same change of circumstance that we've talked about for the last five years? Well, so it's, it's the same requirement. So... Um, but uh, we, the, the senator had asked sort of, are there pieces on this that are sort of inter mm -hmm. with a uh, cost interplay with the exchange? And, and I think it is, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if I can just speak to it this way. So, the change of circumstance, any system that we have has to be, has to um, be ready to accept change of circumstance. In our future planning, the change of circumstance functionality that will replace the Vermont Health Connect, change of circumstance process, manual process that, that we have today, is going to be in customer service portal phase three. Okay. So right now, we do have um, an online uh, change review form that Vermonters can go to a website and fill in a PDF file. They can use the document uploader, so they're going to save it, use the document uploader, um, and it will go into a worker's queue through the new ECM, Electronic Content Management Process, 
in the state run on base solution. That's already there and working. We don't have the portal functionality where yeah. Vermonters can just go to the portal and make a change in the portal right now. That's coming in in customer service phase three. <clears throat> okay. So that basically is another $3 million that would, should be added to the cost of building Vermont Health Connect because that was functionality that was supposed to be in Vermont Health Connect to begin with. Yes. And we now yeah. are, are but they've always, always been they've always yeah. been meshed, right? I mean, their yeah. their health connect was <coughs> supposed to have all of this at yeah. some level, right? If, uh, well, I don't know about all of it. I mean, well, some, inter integrated eligibility but integrated, absolutely the, was the was whole part issue of, of change of circumstance promise. was was clearly the function yeah. uh, to, to begin with, uh, and uh, a lot of the customer service costs associated with this. I mean, I get calls from consumers mm -hmm. with some regularity. Mm -hmm about I've been on hold with Vermont Health Connect mm -hmm. for, for three hours trying to tell them that I just had a baby or whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. and I can't get anybody to do anything about it. I get different answers from everybody I talk to. You, you know, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. sure you've, you've heard all of this mm -hmm. as well. Or you will. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard it. But that's one of the things that's, that, that are generating my questions is it seems very, very difficult to pin a cost on, on what it is that we're doing and also to get a clear understanding of how much are we spending on all of this stuff? You know, how much are we spent on Vermont Health? How much are we spending uh, on integrated eligibility? At what and, and to what extent is the spending uh, on integrated eligibility really a part of the Vermont Health Connect okay. uh, to begin with? And I have heard Sarah say mm -hmm. that she will come yes. to the next report mm -hmm. here and talk to us about the Health Connect overall costs as it relates to IAD, <coughs> as well as the operational costs. Yep. Big picture. It'll so be you're a bigger team us. than me because it's... Okay, good. Okay, but you're hearing us loud and clear. Yeah, I hear you loud and clear. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Quick question. Um, yeah. When you're saying this is, um, <coughs> was supposed to be part of uh, Health Connect, does that mean um, that the charges for that module should be assigned to that project instead of this, or? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's probably a different question. For, yeah. okay. okay. Why don't we let you finish your testimony? So do you want to walk through each of I'm trying to, do you want that level of detail yeah. now, or it, it, it I, I don't, th I think I would maybe just move on to the other folks unless you wanted to go through it. Because so Sarah, it, you know what I think would yeah. be helpful? Mm -hmm. Yeah. For the, um, for the line items <laughs> that we have not been hearing reports on, I think you had started to yep. tell us about those. Yep. Why don't you finish telling us about those? And sure. Then, mm -hmm. So that is going to be, um, uh, let's see, uh, A, B. So A is the IE uh, program support, which I talked a little bit about, right? It's just a kind of um, overall infrastructure support for the IE and E program. And so we can provide you more details about what's underneath this um, because it is the largest number on the page. So and those are not costs associated, right? No, they're not costs associated with any of that. Yeah, it's, yeah so it's, but it's not directly attributable to a project. Yeah. It's in this bucket. Uh, B, um, I'm sure Cass talked to you about the um, requirement from CMS to do the independent verification and validation, IVNV. It's a CMS required review for compliance and ensuring that the state um, is achieving its you know, deliverables and work plan. Is this, in effect, using a, a third party independent reviewer such as a Gartner? That is correct. And then there yeah. are reports that are generated uh, by them uh, on an ongoing basis. That's correct. Uh, by project. That's mm -hmm. correct. And as a matter of fact, we um, share those reports with um, Dan Smith. Okay. <coughs> um, you're aware of the healthcare paper application? Yes. Uh, enterprise content management. Let's see. The um, F, customer portal phase two online application, that's a project that um, has started, but that's uh, budgeted in state fiscal year 20 and 21. Change of circumstance is uh, scheduled to start in state fiscal year 21. Uh, yeah, 21. <laughs> We've taught you are aware of business intelligence, business rules management. Um, 
and I probably am not great at describing what this is, um, but it is something that uh, has to do with expanding um, integrated eligibility behind the he beyond healthcare programs to the economic services programs, and so it's the kind of foundational work to be able to make that happen. Sarah, yes, um, with regard to H, yep. So that's the business intelligence. Mm -hmm. Have we made a decision on that project? <coughs> I'm ready to talk about that one it's during your testimony. Ahead. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Why don't you finish? Sir? Um, okay, uh, J, Federal Report Development, um, again, though it's not called out individually <coughs> here, um, I believe you're aware of it, this has to do with the federal enrollment and tax reporting requirements um, that the state is required to do related to Vermont Health Connect. Um, the next one, K, Premium Processing, that's slated to begin state fiscal year 20. The Worker Dashboard, State Fiscal Year 21. Um, government Procurement, and we talked a little bit about what that is, the contract with 18F for kind of our procurement strategy. Um, and the last one, uh, Master Person Index, Master Data Management, um, is a project that I believe was started and then is, is paused right now. It is paused and it's part of our future roadmap discussions with um, Secretary Quinn and his staff. Could you tell me uh, just a, briefly a little bit about uh, 18F and government procurement as to how it is, as to what, what that consists of? Is anybody more familiar with that than me here? Um. Yeah, I can, I can go into it further. As we discussed in the first hour, um, 18F was hired to um, help us with agile procurement, help us look at our procurement practices in the state to try to streamline and um, get vendors on site in a faster way and still be competitive within the market. So one of the things that they suggested and worked with us on was uh, building retainer buckets of vendors, uh, inviting vendors in um, to competitively bid on areas of work, whether it was you know by the hour, $185 an hour for website work or security work. Uh, they would sign the terms and conditions with the state and be on standby um, to respond to statements of work by the state for work that's $500,000 or less. So part of the approach with um, IE was to build deliverables that were $500,000 or less and to be able to go out to these retainer contracts, put out a statement of work, and get a response back in a couple of weeks rather than doing a full-blown RFP that could take you know, nine months, 12 months, 18 months in some cases, and get to work immediately and start working in smaller buckets trying to get a deliverable that directly affects Vermonters and adds functionality in a, in a smaller way. And, you know, overall, I would say in that bucket, in the procurement bucket, we were very successful with uh, working with them. Okay. So that's kind of project by project yep. list. Um, Okay, Dan, have you had a, have you been able to look at this uh, spreadsheet? Is it uploaded? Yes, I have. He has. Yeah. So just with your with so a yeah. quick, it's not okay. So do you have any questions on this spreadsheet? We're going to move on from it at this point. No, that it pretty much matches with the uh, data that was presented to the corrections and institutions committees uh, back with the original capital request. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, Thank how you. long have you been working on this project? Um, I've been the CFO of AHS for about four and a half years. Okay. I've been in state government for 15, which is a long time, <laughs> but nowhere near my esteemed <laughs> colleague, so I'm in awe of her. <laughs> so. And so has your role changed at all um, with uh, the departure of CAS? Um, well, I'm here today, so I don't think I've met with you guys before, um, but I've um, been testifying in the institutions committees on the capital requests as it relates to IE and E for as long as I've been in my role, so that, that hasn't changed, and I was there supporting CAS last year, um, and so, 
you know, as the CFO of the Agency of Human Services, we have a two and a half billion dollar operating budget. Six different de six different departments from corrections, children and families, um, disabilities, aging, independent living. So that's kind of all under my purview. Um, and so the. Um, IT projects with really the onset of Vermont Health Connect and the kind of major um, efforts that we uh, undertook probably now six, seven, eight years ago. Mm -hmm. um, the kind of financial impact of these large scale IT projects has definitely changed the CFO's job, right? Um, in terms of the responsibility for overseeing um, a large infusion of federal dollars and state dollars for the um, build out of these projects. So, so that happened prior to it happened pr departure. Yeah, prior, okay. yes. But just okay. in terms of the changing nature of this job. Okay. But you know, as you guys know, um, agency had, we still have 20, 30 year old legacy systems that we rely on intensely. And so we're at the end of the life of those. And so, yes. yeah. Okay. Perfect. Great. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Sure. <laughs> Good morning again. So I'm going to cover this portion of the event or the, the testimony. Uh, the business intelligence no project. Event. No event. <laughs> no event. Uh, the business intelligence project has been one that we've uh, struggled with in the past a little bit. I think it's been read for quite a while. Um, as you may recall, we've had a number of issues that um, at first, you know, we called networking issues, um, state network. Um, it looked like there was a, you know, fairly big problem with the state network that was causing replication issues. Right. In the end, we found it was a, a bug with the software that was running on the Vermont Health Connect side and that, and that stack of products uh, specific to a certain version that really only affected the the replication so it was a extremely technical thing that you know it, it took us a long time to figure out we had vendors in anyways we're past that that was the transfer of that, data, that was between transfer of data. Yeah. since then um, we, we've been working on uh, over the past month uh, three weeks uh, the transition what it looks like with uh, new leadership coming in at human services what the work is um, looking at the, the dates that we have set out for completing the BI project and ADS and AHS have committed to being able to finish this project in, in February. Um, at the same time, to, to cover ourselves, we have executed a contingency plan to make sure that we're able to get out uh, mm -hmm. the delivery of 1095s and federal reports if something was to go wrong. But uh, our boots on the ground, our project management, our um, senior leadership teams in these agencies are all feeling confident that we can get this done in, in February. We're, we're done with most of the highly technical work and right now it's looking at the data, comparing the data, building the reports, testing the reports, and based on the timelines that we've put together and the people that we've brought in who have uh, been really instrumental on um, agile process and agile development and being able to plan out these things people that have the most experience are showing that we can do these in in time for, to meet the february deadline so for a first time in, in quite a while i feel i feel pretty strongly that we can we can make this deadline and that we're on the right track you know i, I would say and I, and I mentioned this to laurie's deputy before laurie took this role and before um we knew that Cass was leaving. That, you know, I don't, I don't give Lori's side of the shop, or, which I call the MMIS side, a lot of attention, because they do projects really well, and they've been successful, and they continue to be successful. So usually, when you see a lot of involvement from me, it's because something's gone wrong in the past, <laughs> um, and so I'm feeling very confident in both the ADS and the AHS side that we have the proper leadership in place to do this. I thought 1095s were due by the end of January, so am I, am I just mis misremembering that? They're due at the, by the tax year, so we've already, the contingency that we have in place right now, um, it's really not a contingency, it was like business as usual. So we have the vendor archetype who is going to create these 1095s. What we're going to do 
is while they're creating the 1095s, we're going to replicate it on the, the state side to um, use the data that is migrated over to the data warehouse on the state side to replicate the 1095 process. And so that would be what we'll use to actually test the process to be able to create them in in the next um, tax year. But the forms that Vermonters are getting are out of the legacy, the yes. last year system. And then, uh, if I recall, there was questions, or is it an oracle that's doing the, the, this is the component that we were worried about having to re-up with, right? Because it was, it's tricky that we didn't really want to update to the new oracle, we couldn't really keep the old one, right? So, so if we hit your deadline here in February, does that save us money? Like, are we able to get out of that contract in a way that's going to save us money? Or uh, forgive me, I'm sort of half remembering the what we were talking about, but I just remember there's a lot of interplay there in terms of both system abilities and budgeting. That was sort of a shocking number if we had to keep going very long for it. Right. I do know that the the business intelligence project once stood up saves the state I mean, gross, and please kick me if I'm wrong, about $600,000 a month in these other contracts that we have going on. So, you know, we'll be avoiding that cost once the system has stood up, and that's why we're so committed to this date. As far as the contract date with Oracle, I'm not remembering the exact date on that. Well, so then, thank you. So that, that is my memory. It was a shocking monthly figure. So if we stand this up in February, do we get to take that off, the Oracle <coughs> off in March, or is there a lag? Like, uh, just help me understand that relationship. Gary, yeah, do, do you have a better understanding of the Oracle timeline? Uh, yeah, in, in, uh, after February, we're upgrading all of the Oracle. We're actually upgrading the Oracle <coughs> right now, uh, but it won't go live until February. At that point in time, um, we will uh, be able to, once we get this done, be able to turn off the, what's called the OBIE, which is the business intelligence uh, software, the Oracle software that runs. So it could um, be immediate, as soon as we're right. satisfied. With yep. This. Okay. And right. uh, and then also discontinue the use of the, the contract. <coughs> okay. Thank you. But you can, so we're not locked into a contract past that's February? Not, I guess that's perfect. No, the contract actually ends in February, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. That's okay. correct. That, that's I mean we're, we're that's why you were yeah in, we're moving resources really sure. we're moving resources around we're pulling resources from other departments yeah. we're trying to put the absolute best and brightest on this that will make sure that we have success in the end we're I'm meeting with the, the ADS technicians shop between my deputy and I and Darren um, you know it feels like daily we're paying a lot of attention to this make sure we hit this data Well, I guess if we, part of the contingency, do we have an option of a month-to-month -month sort of arrangement if we find we're a few weeks over, or, or what would we anticipate if we don't hit February, you know, <coughs> do we sign up for another year, another two months, what? Do you, do you have a sense of that, what we'd be looking at? I think I think you're right. We would end up going to a month to month sort of arrangement. Okay. Uh, we'd have to extend the existing <coughs> archetype contract uh, and um, and push out the Oracle upgrade project. And that's right. where those large costs come because we have uh, for those additional months that we would be hiring the vendor uh, and uh, having Optum host duplicative environments yeah. because during the cutovers they're doing two, twice as many. And each environment has, just to give you an idea of scale, around 220 uh, servers in it. Um, you know, we're it, it's a it's a lot of right, right. a lot okay. of extra hosting that we wouldn't need each month thereafter. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dan, do you have any questions on business intelligence? Uh, no, I, the only comments I would have would be on the financial side at this point. Would you like to share those questions? <laughs> okay. I, I didn't want to jump in earlier. And, and again, first, I'd like to apologize for not being there in person. And also say that if I was in person, hopefully this wouldn't come across possibly as harsh. But 
Uh, going back to the original question of how much is IE really going to cost, the approach that AHS and ADS is taking now is an approach that unfortunately means you can't answer that question. You can't look forward and say, this is the final cost of IE. Back in 2015, when AHS was looking at a, a, a contract to say, you know, to some vendor, go out and build IE for us, that brings the comfort of saying, yes, IE will cost X amount of dollars. But unfortunately for that comfort, it, it's based on invalid assumptions and the net cost would have been far greater. And again, we can go back and look at Vermont Health Connect as an example of that. We thought we knew what Vermont Health Connect was going to cost. It ended up costing far more and did less than was expected. The advantage of the approach that's being taken now is that it's being done in a piecemeal fashion. Every year, AHS and ADS and the legislature is going to have to look at the list of what must be done, and CMS mitigation items is an example of that, and the list of things that we'd like to have done, and the um, change of circumstance improvements is an example of that. Look at the costs involved and say, is it worth going forward? The plus side of that is the overall program risks are much less. The negative side is you're never really going to be able to put a handle on how much the thing is going to cost. It's going to be a year-to-year -year exercise in saying, what must we do? What do we want to do? Can we afford it? And do we want to afford it? So without beating that to death, I'd say that is one of the downsides. Uh, it's, it's going to be a lot of work and it's going to be a year to year challenge to figure out what the next year's projects are going to be. The only other thing I'd say is uh, the question of Vermont Health Connect versus IE of how much is in each bucket is almost impossible to answer because there is no clear line between those programs. The IE and Vermont Health Connect from the beginning have been very tightly coupled, very closely intertwined. And being able to put your finger on how much have we spent on IE and how much have we spent on Vermont Health Connect, uh, you'll drive Sarah crazy with that kind of question. But all we can try to do going forward is say, for each system, as closely as we can define them, what are the benefits to each? So you know, in, in the next year or so, the, the customer portal phase three, Yes, it's a change to Vermont Health Connect. Yes, we could probably do without it and continue along with the way things are done now, but it's probably worth the state's and CMS's money to make the, pro the process better for everybody involved. And I will stop rambling there. Uh, that's my take on the financial. It's, it's just going to be a long process. We won't know what IE is going to cost until we've said we're spending enough money, we're done. Well, I understand that the modular approach has its certain advantages and the pluses I'm, I'm fully on board with. At the same time, I think we have an obligation to accountability. And when we uh, establish what essentially is a never-ending chain of costs, we never will know how much we're spending and it's very difficult then to look back over a three, four, five-year period uh, to be able to evaluate, did we do the right things? Have we spent the correct amount of money? Uh, what have we spent and for what? I, I just can't, I can't buy the fact that we can't quantify this. We may quantify yeah, I, it differently. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry, and, and I, have, I agree with you. As we look back to 2013 through, say, 2016, it's, it's unfortunate we can't look back and have a better handle on what was spent for what, what did we get out of it? But I think that's the reality of it. I think in the current process from about, say, 2017 on, we will have a much clearer picture. And, and again, you know, the, the project uh, breakdowns and the costs and estimates going forward, we will have a much better handle on what we are spending on what and what are we getting for it. Uh, but yeah, looking looking back to the beginning, it's it's rough. It's 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 going to be an impossible question to answer. For me, some of these things are about smarter spending, right? So whether, um, and I don't have the cost in front of me, so I'm just going to use some general numbers. If we're talking about business intelligence and it costs us, you know, $3 million, right? How long does it take to get the ROI on that from what we're paying Optum? What's the value behind that to the citizen of Vermont, right? What, 
with the document uploader, what was the cost of that and what's the value to the citizen of Vermont? So if we look at this from a, a different perspective, if you look at it like, I think we may be trying to look at it like what is the entire cost of integrated eligibility? It's a really large number, but if you break it down by the modules that we're delivering at the time and say, what's the value to the citizen of that, that we're actually getting right now and long term, whether we complete all of the integrated eligibility things or not, what's the value of implementing that piece to the citizen and to us? I think if we look at it that way, you can break it down by cost and say, is $3 million worth it to us to, to add that amount of value to the to the to the Vermonter is document uploading making it easier for us um, making it easier for the Vermonter to be able to upload documents so we can turn around and process that faster on the back end with less resources worth the price compared to trying to come up with a 200 million dollar number saying it's going to do all of these things and trying to wrangle it all in one big number I think that's really difficult but I think if we look at it in smaller chunks kind of like how we're building it out and look at the value story behind each one, you can kind of break it down a little simpler. Or at least that's the way I'm looking at it in my mind. You can measure each little cut, but what you really want to know is how much blood did you did you spill? And I can't accept the fact that we don't know and can't figure it out. I just I from a basic fundamental system of government accountability, I, I simply cannot accept that. Can, can, okay. Are we done with the business intelligence piece for right now? I think we are done with the business okay. intelligence piece for right now, yes. Okay, so a little more about how we plan for the transition of CAS leaving on October 18th. So um, when CAS gave her notice about leaving um, <coughs> the beginning of October, um, we um, immediately went to a structure um, to that would align um, with the way CMS had actually been structuring. Just this past summer, they released a new organizational structure where our state representative um, was going to be responsible for all three programs, so MMIS, IE&E, &E, and HIT. And we looked at that and said, is there an opportunity to bring um, the executive sponsorship and the leadership team that we had in MMIS and share that leadership team with the IE&E programs to help um, move these programs forward. And we quickly um, decided that that, might not, that would be a really good structure. Um, we have foundational teams in the MMIS program already built. We have teams that are responsible for CMS certification and if um, I'll explain a little bit about certification. Certification is um, when you're allowed to get enhanced funding for your maintenance and operations costs. So in MMIS, that's, um, certification is something that we're really used to. In the last three years, we have certified uh, pharmacy benefit management solution, and, um, and we also have certified a care management solution, which is the first um, solution in across um, the country that CMS has ever certified. We've also, um, next Thursday, we're hosting CMS to certify our provider management module. So just in the last two or three years, we've certified um, three modules um, in our MMIS program. So long story short, Bringing IE and E into the MMIS, we're going to be able to share a really strong leadership team. We're going to also be able to share all of these foundational teams that we've already built, and we'll be able to streamline the processes. We have leads in every one of these teams. A recent example is um, the the reports that John and his team are um, are building. We have already shifted over to our QA and testing team, and they're starting to test them. If we hadn't combined these teams, um, we would have had staff in the IE&E program that would have had to leave their day jobs to do the testing 
on these reports. So I, it's going to be more efficient. We're using experienced resources, and um, I think it will make a big difference. The projects will continue to align with the CMS guidance, and will proceed in a blend of waterfall modular, um, et cetera, processes. So I am hearing you say this will be more efficient. Mm -hmm. Will it be equally or more effective? I say yes. Okay. And uh, are we are we uh, have you are you now doing your old job and Cass's job at the same time? Like is that like so Cass's job was, she was deputy commissioner, and she had responsibility for the IE&E program, and she also managed that, um, she oversaw the health access eligibility unit and 140 employees there. And she also had different other responsibilities um, in DIVA. She was responsible for performance improvement and other things. My main responsibilities, to answer your question, I'm gonna be doing the job I did before, and I'm also going to be the executive sponsor over IE and E. But the reason why I can do that is that I'm an executive sponsor. I have an incredible team, mm -hmm. and I have incredible relationships built. You know, and I have the relationships built across the agency. So that's helpful. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you know is that position um, is Cass's? the remaining aspects of Cass's position uh, expected to be filled? Do you have any insight into that? I don't really at this point. Okay. I haven't heard that we're not filling it. Okay. But, so. but the piece that we are interested in, which is integrated yeah. eligibility, you are taking I am doing that. that. In addition to what you were doing. Yes, I am. Okay. And you have the capacity within your existing teams Yes. to do that is what I'm giving you stuff. Yes. Are there staff that transfer over to you? And, and not there sure is. How many? Uh, I can get back to you with that number. We're still okay. trying to figure this out. Um, okay. Uh, what, you know, we have lots of pro, uh, project management staff that we've been meeting with regularly. We have product owners that we meet with regularly, but a count of how many of them um, that we'll be transferring over from IE and E into this, you know, broader um, team. I don't have a count, a specific count. It's a gray that. area because our teams are so so meshed together mm -hmm. in the roles and working together. It's, you know, was there overlap previously between the two projects? I can hear Dan wants to probably yeah. come in. <laughs> but what were there? people that overlapped between the two? Um, there are some projects that overlap. Um, MMIS has been launching TMSIS, and I won't bore you with details because it is a lot of detail on that, but we had to rely on... Who would like to make a call? Please hang up and try again. The, um, we had to rely on staff, uh, uh, the Health Access Eligibility Unit Director, Thani Boscalio, um, she, she would be working on that TMSIS project with us. So we had overlap uh, between projects, but we didn't really have integration, I, I think is probably the way to describe it. Okay. Do you anticipate, um, I've heard you say more efficient. Mm -hmm. I've heard you say you believe that this will be equally effective. Mm -hmm. um, do you anticipate um, adding staff, reducing staff? Well, I can tell you in, excuse me, in the last three weeks we've been able to um, use a, um, a project manager that had some bandwidth that was working on an MMIS project and we've moved them over to an ECM project. So I think overall it's going to be a fit more efficient. It should be less costly. You know, because we're we're working across both programs, and we can use the ebb and flows in project work, and move them over to other projects that need resources. So, where is that cost savings going to come from if it's less costly? Do you anticipate? So, I think you'll see it most in the the program, the um, IE program support. You'll 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 see 
you should see less cost there <laughs> and less cost in the MMIS program support if we can leverage it either way, right? Is that contracted services or those like state employees? It's a blend. blend. Okay. Yeah, we use contracts for staff AUG and we also use state employees. Okay. Great. So <coughs> we are well over your time. <laughs> um, but this has been helpful. I appreciate you working so hard to provide us an update in such a short amount of time that you've been grasping with us. Do you want to walk us through the rest of the I presentation? And very quickly. So I think um, I touched upon our um, certification successes. So um, again, care management, we certified this. Um, and we, we actually got the letter in October of 2019. We were able to go back and collect um, enhanced funding at 75% back to 1117 with this certification. So that, that's a big win financially. Um, again, we're hosting CMS next week, Thursday. We're gonna certify this provider management module and hot off the press this morning, we learned that um, Puerto Rico is actually coming to us on, on December 5th, staff working on an MMIS launch of the provider management. They're coming um, December 5th to talk to us about how we were able to launch this um, provider management module in less than a year. Mm -hmm. And they want to talk to us about how um, they can replicate some of that. If they need us to go there. <laughs> I said it'll be a rude awakening being here in yeah, December. <laughs> so there's just the success of the project there. You know, we were. <coughs> This was a legislative mandate because it was taking us so long, over 120 days to enroll a provider when we launched this project and now we're enrolling providers in 18 to 23 days. So we're going to continue to employ this modular approach for ie &E projects in 2020. We've launched the premium processing project. That's also legislative man, uh, legislatively mandated and that brings, that sends the premium billing back to the issuers and that is currently on time on budget and on scope we have customer portal phase two which has just launched in the last week week and a half i think and that's um, the online application project so that's where they'll be able to enter this portal vermonters will and they'll be able to um, electronically apply for health care coverage and we're on time, on budget, and on scope. Great. Thank you You're very welcome. much You're for welcome. coming in. Um, I'm sure you've been working hard to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure that we're going to meet in December. We may meet in December, but it sounds like um, you all, I heard, about six weeks. So you might appreciate um, not coming back to talk to us until January? That would probably be very appreciated. Okay. And so at that time, um, <clears throat> I want to be clear that we send uh, these folks off with a um, very clear idea of what we want them to testify on. Based on, mm -hmm. um, based on Dan's comments, your concerns, um, as I said, right now I've got this question here, Vermont Health Connect, Vermont Health Connect costs and how they relate to IE and E, and I'm hearing Dan say that that's going to be really challenging. So, do we want to? Do you have recommendations, Sarah, on so, based on our questions on what might be more helpful? So I think, and I'm just trying to go back in history a little bit because we had probably it was three years ago, maybe now we did kind of testify this committee didn't exist then, mm -hmm. right? So to, to different legislators. Um, so I'm right now, I think my approach would be similar to what we did the, the last time. Mm -hmm. And there's actually, if you look in the November 1st report, um, there is on page 19, there is some financial information surrounding kind of what we've spent on Vermont, Vermont Health Connect and IE and E from the, from the kind of dawn of these projects. Um, and so there is the accounting for it at a very high level, what we've spent. But Dan, you know, his comments were very on point in that it's, it's hard to determine 
um, where Vermont Health Connect ends and integrated eligibility and enrollment begins. But I think in my mind, I understand your question and I will you know, do my best to answer it with the information that I have. Well, to me, the, uh, the issue is the functionality. And the functionality that was uh, allegedly built into Vermont Health Connect uh, from the time that it was initiated up until now, how much have we spent to deliver that particular functionality? Not to maintain it, but to deliver it. So we have the original development cost in Vermont Health Connect, which presumably we'd be able to quantify. We have the amount of money that we have spent over and above normal operational needs to hire contractors, temporary employees, and other workarounds to do things that Vermont Health Connect was alleged <laughs> to have been done. It was part of the original specification that wasn't done, and still to this date has not been done. We should be able to quantify that. We know that there's certain aspects of what we're doing here in integrated eligibility that was specifically part of that original Vermont Health Connect deliverable. And we should be able to quantify at least what we've spent to date and what we have budgeted, uh, such as the phase three change of circumstance, which was part of the original Vermont Health Connect. We should be able to quantify that. So those are specifics that we should be able to come up with both an actual to date and a budget to get the total amount for that. So I'm agreeing with you. I'm not. Yeah. I, I, okay. I, yeah. I think it's the the whole conversation around the deliverable and what Vermont Health Connect was that I can't speak to. The accounting. I can talk to you about the accounting mm -hmm. for it. Okay. Okay. So do you feel comfortable with? what you're hearing Senator Brock say he'd like to understand. Yes, like but I will tell you, I will be reaching out to <coughs> probably both of you and yep. the mm -hmm. joint fiscal Great. staff and Dan Smith leading up to the meeting. Great. Cool. Yep. Because it's a it's the it's a combination, right? There's the accounting for it, but it's the it's the other stuff that's it's hard to, to pull apart. Okay. And it's well I mean I, I think originally what we're what we're saying here is with this modular approach, in many cases you are taking what historically has been a capital expenditure and you're really operationalizing it because it becomes uh, an ongoing decision point on a year versus year basis as to what you're going to do versus, you know, it, it, it may be in, just in terms of thinking ahead that the way we account for things may, 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 may need to be different, may need to be changed because of that. Uh, I, I, but it's hard for me to think, for example, that if you're a private company, if your IT chief comes to you and says, I don't know what we're going to spend to do this function, and I never will know, and there's no way that I can tell you, that would not be an acceptable answer. No private company would operate that way, and I don't think government should. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> so we have uh, two items, three items actually. Uh, one is uh, committee discussion and markup with Be Becky. Uh, we are over. We are. How are you for time? Because we are over time. Uh, okay. Do you have another meeting? Um, I can. What time? I guess late tonight. What? <laughs> okay. Um, well, yeah, maybe. <laughs> what time is your other meeting? Is it? Um, So we should we should go through the memo first. Then, yes. So we want to we want to go through this memo. Um, I also would like to um, talk about if we don't meet in December, how we could move. Would you like to walk through this? What sure. would make what would make this easiest um, for you? Yeah, I can. I can generally walk through the structure and okay. then um, I think go over the bullet points. Okay. Um, so. Great. Okay, so Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council. Um, so the memo is now separated out into um, three parts. The first is the introduction, um, and this is just saying how often the committee met and um, what witnesses testified at committee meetings during that time. Um, it's pretty general, so I didn't know if you wanted to <coughs> specifically list all of the witness names here, so that's a question. Are you all? I, the one note that I have is, as I mentioned here, the chief auditor, and I think we actually met with the state auditor. We did not meet with, uh, did we, did we ever meet with? With uh, um, Tanya? Yeah, Tanya Moore? Morehouse, did she come in? Uh, she was on the, on the
on the list on the website. But well, maybe we maybe meet with Doug Hoffer. Maybe it was just a, ri a written yeah. <laughs> testimony. She wasn't documented as a witness in our database. I'll, I'll check that. Okay, I'll be sure. I think we wanted okay. to at one point, but we didn't. Okay. okay. Um, so in the um, second section, it's recommendations that the committee would be sharing with um, other committees of jurisdiction. And then um, the third section is the status of IT projects. And I think that's the section that probably needs the most detail. <laughs> um, so in terms of recommendations, um, we've been compiling over the last couple meetings a, a number of bullet points, so I can just start to go through them all. The first is to recommend to the committees of jurisdiction um, that they address workforce development initiatives in the IT profession. <coughs> and so what was discussed was including reviewing state employment needs, the promotion of the profession, secondary and post-secondary training, and deficiencies in pay. This, um, are we talking about state workforce development needs when you're trying to win in this outline or in this bullet? State employees it's including state reviewing state employees. So, I, so cause, it's cause it, I think we should it sort of mix together here, but I mean, we've heard from employers that this is a challenge. We've heard from municipalities that this is a challenge, and we've heard from our own people that this is a challenge. So, so generally, and I, you know, including state yeah, place. right. I mean, when we're talking about deficiencies of pay, I assume that's our own, you know, state government yeah. challenge. I, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm not making sense here. I'm so, not quite so would it make sense to just cross out state in front of employment needs because it's it's really both. Are you saying it's both the public and private sector? Well, I'm asking that. It I, is, to me, and I know, it is. as we've done in the yeah. in the Economic Development Committee, which deals with these workforce issues in the Senate, this this is a recognition that it is a statewide issue, yeah. not solely a state government issue. So I, I think it's appropriate that we, we, we do it more generally. But the deficiencies in pay is specific to state. So that's state, right. Uh, that, yes, that's yes. what that's, I'm That's true, to say. you're right. And, and so it, it's just a bit jumbled here, right. and I think it's, I think it is, we want it, to, for my needs, we want to encourage the committees to look at the whole suite of it. Clearly, when they look at state government's IT needs, the pay issue is a big yeah. one. Yeah. Good point. Um, so. okay. Great. And, and I guess I would also like to suggest that um, secondary and post-secondary training, uh, to me, I want to be sure, maybe this is already happening, that, for instance, Vermont Technical College is aware of this, that our, that our, um, you know, that our voc ed programs are engaged in this. And so I don't, you know, maybe they are, they probably are, but it seems like we would want committees to check in that specifically, but I don't know. Okay. Maybe, and maybe that's too specific. Awareness but. and training. Yeah, I mean, okay. it's not just, it's not just, uh, yeah, I mean, here the training, I think of those as sort of state programs, but it's kind of a curriculum, it could be a curriculum, you know, I think it's just more broad. So would that be another bullet, perhaps, just on education, sort of a, a review of what offerings there are in the state? In terms of program, like training and programs, so maybe mapping out the um, sort of the pipeline. Well, it is the pipeline. It's, no, it's I pathway, think that's the that's right. I, I, um, well, yes. maybe it is a, a different bullet because it's education more likely pathways. to go to education different, and different committees. Um, you know, it's all interwoven. But you mm -hmm. would want, it seems to me, we would want our education committees to have this kind of discussion, like there's this huge need, there are good jobs yep. available, are, are, we want to know if our programs are kind of aimed at that, I mean, is that too silly? 
No, it's not. It's I mean, and, and we've, we've certainly done it with other, with, with other professions. And we, we, ha we have a, a suite of things that we say, we know that we have critical needs in, 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 uh, in construction, in nursing. Uh, yeah, nursing and some of the healthcare, a lot of healthcare professions and so on, and just to make sure that information technology and information uh, uh, security uh, are among the critical needs that we have in Vermont and that we have workforce development programs that recognize those needs and, 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 and focuses on the pathway to fulfilling them. Do you have it? Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, let's Thanks. go to the next. So the next one is um, a review of both federal and state statutory provisions on cyber crimes to determine any deficiencies. And last time there was also a discussion of requesting an opinion from the AG's office about um, whether any statutes need to be modernized. I'm okay with that. Um, I, I think what I've heard from other testimony in the meantime is that those things are generally addressed already. I'm not sure if we necessarily need to call it out or just kind of an ongoing thing. I'm happy to pull um, the bullet if you want to pull the bullet. Did anybody else have any feelings on it? I really I want to read the statutes <laughs> regarding cyber crimes. I haven't, I've, I've spent a long time since I've read them just to just have an understanding as to whether or not we see the issue based on what we've heard here over this past year. To, to me, it's an excellent question, but we've kind of heard that yeah. it's not a big gap. Okay. Yeah. So I would take so it let's pull it up. Okay. Three. Um, the next bullet has to deal uh, deals with a risk assessment process. So developing an IT risk assessment process within state government to ensure that the state prioritizes the um, IT risks that it faces, responds effectively to those risks, and has a process in place to raise um, inadequate, inadequate risk response to the legislature for that action. And there would be um, a couple entities involved in that process, including ADS, other executive branch agencies, the legislative committees of jurisdiction, and the state auditor. And I had, this came from Senator Brock, and I had paraphrased it to fit into the um, structure of the memo. And there was um, a note in there about the state auditor's um, ability to perform this mission, whether or not they have enough resources. So I, I put that footnote in there, but I didn't know if you wanted to include that in the memo. No, I, I think that we would. I would want to include that in that memo. Well, if we don't include it in the memo, then I think we yeah. need to include that we want, and I think we need the word auditing in here. Or do, well, yeah. No, the independent auditor, the state auditor is, is for independent yeah. auditor. I think that's, that's correct. The only question is whether or not this resource issue ought to be included, and I think I, I would. I just think we ought to consult with Hopper before we put it in there. I, I, Make sure we're all on the same page. I, yeah, I do think. I mean, I think you could ask the same question of what we're asking the agency of digital service. You, you know, to me, the question is baked into anything we're asking. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that it needs to be called out, especially here. But my experience with Auditor Hopper is he's more than uh, capable of raising that concern when he's given new tasks. So then maybe we want to, rather than be concerned, we want to work with the auditor to have this function happen. So the bullet point is saying that this process should include all those entities, so it would be yeah. including the auditor okay. in there. Great. So take out the footnote. Yeah. Um, the next bullet deals with proposing legislation. Um, so this would be uh, creating an annual reporting requirement to the legislature on level three, four, and five cybersecurity incidents um, by system and require state agencies and entities accessing state collected or generated data to develop data backup protocols. And there was some discussion last time about whether this would 
be needed and also um, how this legislation would be uh, proposed because well, this, this committee we, can't can't do that so. what we were really talking about I think and, and you had raised the issue was that if some horrible incident occurs uh, should the legislature or some subset of it be notified about it and if so at what frequency and I think one of the goals was not to provide uh, a reporting mechanism that was overly onerous uh, uh, but that knowing that we've had some kind of problem is something that we ought to be aware of. And I am aware that uh, in speaking with Representative Brigland from House Energy and Technology that he intends to put forward a cybersecurity bill. So, yes, we pretty, yes. So, so we should this be start. a phrase to recommend to that committee yes. to include this yeah. in a cybersecurity bill? Yes. Yeah. But I would, do you mean to say an annual reporting requirement or a, at time of incident or <coughs> periodic so and leave it more, more general? Yeah. So somewhere in between is where I would actually be yeah. comfortable. Me too. So, so um, maybe just say a reporting requirement. And leave at least requirement. annually or biannually. So what we've heard is that um, at the time of the incident could be, could be challenging. Uh, because sometimes they're taking some time. They, they really can't report to us. Right, right. Well, <coughs> I don't need it that hour. Yeah. And the right. other thing is the, it, it, the specificity of level three, four, or five cybersecurity incidents it makes the question, is that a footnote? Because you know, what, most people won't have a clue of what we're talking well, about. Uh, but I think because what we've talked about is, you know, that there are these issues that happen all the time, yeah. we could be overloaded. And sure. I think Secretary Quinn has actually, um, <clears throat> three, four, and five are more serious. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. What's a two? Tell, tell me what's a two. Um, something that may affect um, a small, small group of maybe state employees. How or, small? Um, left to be determined by me. Okay. I don't. I don't want to put a. I don't want to put a ten people. I don't want to put a fifteen people. I think it depends. There's a lot that goes into it. it depends yep. on the type of data. Is it just PII? Like okay. what is involved? Okay. You know, if it was uh, something that was going to make the news, yep. even if it was just eight people, I would raise that to a you know higher level. So essentially, really, it's a periodic reporting requirement well, I mean, of significant or serious security incidents. So should we ask the news guy? <laughs> <laughs> What's a level three? Depends on whether it's a slow news day. Exactly. Uh, okay. So, well, I think this will get yeah. some discussion in committee. Yes. So. Are you good with that, Becky? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so the next bullet is another recommendation to the committees of jurisdiction about understanding the administration's prioritization of risk in the system, and that would include um, which IT systems are at greatest risk for theft of Vermonters' data, and which systems' disruption would pose the greatest threat to public safety. I would say I would add to that the greatest threat to public safety or to the operations of government. Systems, mm -hmm. I think, should have an apostrophe yes, after it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are you good? Yep. Um, so the next would be to fund a third party assessment of cybersecurity risks posed by local governments to the state system and develop parameters with. Um, BLCT in conjunction with uh, the Secretary of State's office and ADS. Uh, I'd like to, I think that's smart, but I also, I think, I wonder if this, we also just need to understand the cybersecurity risk posed by local governments, not only, this sort of hinges it to our own systems. It, it, you know, when, when the town of Bradford gets hit with a two million dollar ransom request, you know we're going to need to deal. <laughs> we're going to be engaged. So it's not only the intersection to the state systems that I think is a state interest 
if that makes sense. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite there with you. You don't agree? or you No, don't I don't understand. understand. Well, this says the cybersecurity risk posed by local governments to the state systems. And I think that it's clear that municipal systems have their own risks just to their own systems. So you like an assessment overall of yeah. the municipal systems. Is Karen in here? Um, and so what would we do with that assessment? Well, uh, I think that we ought to be looking for ways where the state um, centralizes some municipal IT functions and, and makes it easier for them and makes it more secure for the, our communities overall. But, you know, I'm kind of tying into that sweet thing. From yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty far out of my knowledge base here. But. That could be a pretty big chunk. And I, you know, I, I, I just wonder whether or not the, 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 the state should do what the federal government does, so for its agencies in a lot of cases, and that is define a set of best practices uh, as well as the ability for them to decide whether they're going to do it or whether they're not. But in some cases where it affects the state systems, that's where I think we, we, may, we may make certain things mandatory in order to interact with state systems. But beyond that, I think the municipalities, uh, I'm not sure that the notion of doing a risk assessment for all the municipalities in the state, that, that's, a, that's a big chunk well, and potentially a big number. So I don't, uh, okay, somewhere in between there is, I, I'm not sure we need to do uh, an across the board risk assessment. I think it could be just an analysis of, um, you know, what is the landscape that we could be faced with? I mean, you, you've heard, we've all heard the news reports of significant yep. cities, right, that, that have found themselves in deep hot water. Uh, and so I, you know, I agree with you that we don't need a, a, a town by town um, risk assessment, but I don't want to tie this just to the intersection of state systems because I think that these are community systems that I, I don't know. You, you, what do you think? So, well, uh, the the bigger towns like Burlington have the budget to do this sort of an assessment themselves. The smaller towns, which would be the hardest to assess, also have the smallest budget so, <coughs> and likely to pose the the largest potential risk of that particular system per capita, you know? So, well, I have a question, to... actually. Uh, Secretary Quinn, when uh, Jill Rummick was testifying earlier, um, we noted that there was a small percentage of municipalities that said they get their IT services from the state of Vermont. Is that true? Do you know? I don't have enough information to answer that. Okay. I think it's their IT service. Okay. So, um, but do you provide any municipal services through ABS? No, it's just internal. Do, um, do we, across state government, BCGI, our uh, uh, Center for Geographic Information, they provide some services yep. to regional planning. Yep. Okay. Um, agencies may provide some help desk type support on systems that directly interact. You know, they may have forgot their password. Um, those types of things, but okay. So, what if we just leave it as is, but then sort of say, uh, uh, also explore sort of these issues at the uh, our need to understand the potential impact of uh, municipal cybersecurity issues, uh, so on the state, something like that. I've moved under the IT. I have a, bu a new bullet from our previous discussion around the possibility of state like state services that could be okay. offered to municipalities, so maybe we'll stick that under okay. there. Um, I do think, um, you know, the notion of doing some sort of polling um, could be interesting. I don't know if there's, I think this is fine. I think this is fine as it is. As fine as it is, because we can add uh, more. These can get fleshed out a bit more. Yeah, and the, the, yeah. the let's have, I, I was going to say maybe we could kind of shorten it a little bit. Uh, fund a third-party assessment of the cybersecurity uh, risk landscape of for uh, city, uh, local, and state governments. Period. 
so it's more broad, and then yeah. you, you depend on the and committee, the committee to, to, to yeah. take more testimony and yeah. narrow it down. Great. All right, Randy. Yeah, I guess. I, I don't want to, you know, uh, to appear as if we give them a blank check for a two million dollar risk assessment. <coughs> <laughs> I don't think they cash our checks. Okay. <laughs> good. Becky, you good on that? It'll be like the rest of IT. You can't measure it anyway. Okay. Be good. Okay. Yes. Uh, so the next bullet is. Uh, require new IT project funding proposals to report on the compatibility between um, existing and proposed technologies. So, uh, Secretary Quinn, <coughs> is this required? Okay. Um, <laughs> if there's a if there's a funding proposal for a new IT project, uh, there has to be a report on whether there's compatibility between existing and proposed technologies. So in statute now, uh, the Agency of Digital Services is responsible for choosing the technology solution, yeah. which puts it all in my agency, right? So yeah. the compatibility is looked at by our enterprise architecture. I don't think it necessarily needs to go into law. I mean, there's only <coughs> one IT group. So the compatibility um, is, is looked at as part of the process. And we, we don't... We wouldn't let someone go forward with something if it didn't make sense for the state as far as compatibility to other systems, unless if the business case was there where we had to do something because of a mandate or okay. for some of the reasons. But we're so. looking to build best practices here, not rely on what a good job you do, which is absolutely the case. Right, but I guess what I'm saying is it's in law already by giving ADS the... It is in law already. ADS is ADS responsible for the technology solutions. So you have to report on that to the legislature. So this, I'm yeah, thinking specifically, you're coming with a funding proposal that you, yeah, I guess, okay. Yeah, it does okay. seem. All right, then let's take that out. Yeah. Take it out, okay. Okay, uh, the next would be the creation of a joint cybersecurity council to plan and oversee cooperation and communication on cybersecurity issues between the three branches of government. Uh, so I would like to leave that in. Um, I know that the three branches are working, and I would love for them to, um, you know, maybe just explain, it, just to continue um, forward into the session with that. Yep, go ahead, Senator Pearson. Well, um, I think this makes sense, but I wonder if we could come a little short of sort of urging the creation, but rather like, just, just sort of. I think this is a good conversation for the committees to have. I'm not comfortable saying that we should create a joint commission. And, and, uh, so consider creation. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, formalize. Um, yeah, explore uh, ways method to formalize. for the three branches to um, cooperate on these things. I like that. Collaborate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Share information. I was going to mm -hmm. add on to that. If it if it is the creation of something, it might make sense to put it into the bullet point um, relating to the cybersecurity bill because it would have to be created in legislation. Although it sounds like now you don't want legislation on it. Well, where's the cybersecurity? <laughs> I mean, I think we need a plan to to do all of these things. I'm just I, I'm a little uncomfortable being, saying we've met and discussed it, and we think there needs to be a joint cybersecurity council. That, that's, yeah, does that make sense? Uh, so, I'm like keeping it a little bit more loose, like formalize it. I I'd be okay with like a I don't know a joint memo from all the heads of the IT teams of all three branches saying, hey, here's what our best practices are and what we're going to do. We I think they're that. working on MOUs. Yeah, yeah. Or at least some of them are. So what? So does I, <coughs> you wanted? You were suggesting we include it somewhere else. If you were going to keep it as is, it's. It looks to create a council would be something you'd have to do in law. Yeah. So I thought it might fit into the bullet point 
on recommending to, it sounds like the House Energy and Technology is thinking about doing a cybersecurity bill. So it might be something that would fit into that bill if it is something you would like in law. Yes. What, and that's probably where we want to figure that out, whether that's necessary. But for now, I'll just keep it more informal. I think that's fine. And we wanted to make it consider as opposed to create. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, just spent about half of yesterday in the Sunset Advisory Commission getting rid of IT councils. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We don't want to create more. Uh, okay. Are you good? Yep. Okay. Next is um, assessing and reporting on vulnerabilities that legislators pose to the state systems and um, recommending some sort of periodic training for legislators on cybersecurity. So I would like that to be an end goal, that there is a recommendation on periodic training for legislators on cybersecurity. So is that really a direction to the actually don't know what they're called now that they're in the, the new legislative IT department to do this? I would think more of the speaker and the potential. Yeah. Okay. Do we, do yes, we, I, that I, makes sense. I, I'm not sure who we would be asking to assess and report on the vulnerabilities. Right. So Kevin would assess and then... Uh, but he's already done that right. and it's a risk. So I yeah. think we should just say that we recommend periodic legislative training on cybersecurity. Required. Yeah, required. required. Yes, yes. yes. Recommend required legislative. Yeah, I mean, the periodic is sort of baked in out of the fact. But I'm not sure we need, they are already assessing and reporting on all of this. And, yeah, okay. So, let's take that off. Those uh, but one of the things Kevin said was that uh, he, for privacy reasons, couldn't really share any of the info. So, do we need to come up with something that says, if you're posing a risk to a system, you are no longer <laughs> expecting the right of privacy? Right. Um, so that that can be specifically addressed. Uh, so, training to include uh, yeah. procedures that legislative IT contain. takes to contain you. Ensure <laughs> <laughs> um, system security. Yeah. So maybe that's a question that I, I think Kevin has policies already on that. So maybe that's just a question of if he has that in his policies already. Um, and then if he does to, in, to let legislators know that in the training. Yes. And but for instance, yeah. he, he talked about, does he have the right to say, you know, Senator Pearson, you've been a repeatedly a bad actor. Your access is now truncated and limited in some way. That's what he was asking us. And he didn't feel that he had the authority now, if I remember. And so the question, is that sort of what yeah. you're getting at? Like, we would need to set that up for ourselves. Yeah. And basically, who does have that authority to pull the plug on a sitting legislator? Does the pro tem and the speaker, does the ethics committee have that responsibility? Does anybody have that right now? It could be in the rule. I, I could look in the rules to see if there's something yeah. that would be applicable. Yeah, so I think that would be helpful note to note that, that and say explore, yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> explore policies to figure out how to slap ourselves on the list. Your speaking spell. <laughs> you can have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I guess I'm just wondering what what is the the penalty that you're taking Ac off of this so system? So access or no access? Yeah. Like I you have no ledge. I mean, I, I don't know. Like, so it's a question that you wouldn't be able to have like a legislative email address anymore. Uh, I don't. That wasn't what I heard. It was more about what networks you're allowed on. Well, I, I don't think we need to answer this. The, the point is to have that conversation. They need to figure right. out. We need to have a training, and we need to have a protocol for, you know, handling uh, our internal risk. Uh, 
behaviors or something like that. And I guess there's a quite good question that, that Becky has raised is, is there anything in the rules right now? I don't know that there is. That's something I can look into. Yep. The next is evaluating the need and cost for a legislative expert, and this is similar to what Dan Smith does, and this could either be an individual or a firm um, that would provide some cybersecurity technical assistance to the legislature. Yeah, because it's us. You know, saying John's doing a good job. And Jeff, you know, you know, I feel like it would be we need some technical assistance. Consider funding an innovation fund within ADS for the purpose of addressing one-time cybersecurity upgrades or fixes. So, I've put this in here because I believe that most of ADS, I think all of your funding oh, is built right. back, right? It's all like yeah, like point zero zero one percent is general fund, right? Directly. People so that's hard that. for you to be proactive, is that what I'm saying? <coughs> yeah, so it's hard to, so we can see 200 case management systems out there, but it's hard for us to build something in advance and say, hey, come here. We have to wait till there's a project started and then try to build it into an enterprise solution as, you know, things are trying to so happen. We, can we describe this right here with this? No. Yeah. We have not described it well. Is that what you said? No, I mean, an innovation fund and um, one-time security money is, one-time money overall, honestly, really doesn't help me all that much because of the models that IT has moved to. They're all subscription-based, so whether we're buying an endpoint protection that's gonna help desktop um, stay secure, those are yearly costs. Those are, there are very few one-time costs. We did that with the, the hardware that we bought last year, there was BAA money, one one time BAA money that worked. But again, we're gonna we're gonna come back into that five or six years from now. So what would we change this to create an annually? Do you annual want to focus on cybersecurity or innovation? I say. I was going to say, uh, consider funding an innovation fund within the Agency of Digital Services for the purpose of um, systems upgrades and so forth. Uh, Modernization. Yeah. Um, so it's not tied to a specific... Systems uh, upgrade. Would it be that or would it be, uh, would the focus be on standards, modernization standards established by the Agency of Digital Services that should be applied throughout state government uh, with particular emphasis on cybersecurity and just simply provide a fund for that purpose. That but seems somewhere like a separate thing. But, but, but somewhere, I mean, it's, it's, I would think it would be standards driven what, what you're doing. You're trying to do something that would apply a standard. And here we talk about cybersecurity across state government. And the problem that you have in, in implementing right now is be, you, you, you typically can't do anything unless a particular agency or organization is going to upgrade that particular system. So it makes it very, very difficult to apply something across the board. Is that yeah. I think what you're saying? Yeah, I think, I think you're right. You know, we have standards that, are, um, that we're going to be talking about with judiciary and the legislature in the next couple of weeks. We have a meeting set. But in that are, are some goals, really. There's standards, but we know that there's some of them that we don't make, and there's money that are that's needed in order to get to that standard. So, with that line of thinking, yeah, we would use money to to fund us getting to that standard, right? You know, the, the different technologies that are needed, but it's not none of they're not one-time things. That's that's the struggle. There's, not, there's nothing in your 
creation statute that prohibits you from getting a budget line item, right? Put it so. in Vermont Health Connect. Nobody even noticed. <laughs> okay. Does that bother you? <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I'm sympathetic to this, and I, you know, Let's go. The secretary works <coughs> for the governor, and the governor presents a budget. So uh, that's an interesting tension. There. Where would this go? Like, who would, which committee would look at this? Appropriations, I mean. Yeah. The budget. We're just talking about money. Yeah. That's where it's. So we want to look at also e annual, I'm sure, yeah, general fund appropriation. That would be. Yeah, there's no other Where's the revenue coming from to fund it? Right. So, I mean, it's basically in both line committees. <coughs> I think let's leave it here and let, let, let's, let this conversation, I think it'll percolate out. Yeah. And, but the, with the changes that I think Seth had, well, or somebody had. So one of the questions I have is, that we started with, um, is who is this going to? Yes. So there's a lot of talk of the committees of jurisdiction, but at this point it almost seems like it's, it's a lot of the <laughs> committees, so it's, you know, appropriations, um, energy and technology, GovOps potentially, yes. economic development. Yes. Um, did I say institutions? No, um, probably. Uh, yeah, education. So, is it? Yeah, who, do you want to specify the committees yes. still? Yeah, okay. I think so, and I think I'd like to try and maybe break it up by committee. Okay. Does that make sense? I mean, because so write a separate one to, to different. Or just to no, the, I think just within the Mount Lowell. Okay. So you know. People oh, can. separate out to within the Mount Lowell yeah. which committees. This this would be going to. Yeah. Because people will then be able to see the other things and go, wait a minute, that should have been with us, or, or not, or thank God it's not. Well, one thing is, doing that will will make this longer, won't it? Uh, I mean, I, one thing I would love to do is, is to keep this no more than two, than, than two, two pages Yeah. Uh, to get to the point rather than produce a long report that nobody's going to read. I think we've pulled a couple of things off of here. We've pulled two and a half items off of here. And we've had, I think, in, in the introduction, we, well, I guess we haven't specifically talked about what systems we've examined, but my question is whether or not item three is is even necessary. Because we don't item three? Design, oh. yeah, we don't really say anything in item three. Uh, well, I, that's because that's well, and I think Becky had said that that we may need to. I think that was a just a placeholder for right yeah. now, and so right. if the committee wants to add something, um, I can I can add in more detail. Uh, so I think that I would like to work with. Uh, maybe JFO on the integrated eligibility here on uh, recommendations for integrated eligibility um, going into the session. Like, here are the items that we are watching going into the session. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I would like to uh, note. Uh, Note that we have a tri branch working group um, uh, doing some cybersecurity uh, work. Do we need to know that? Do we need to know that? So, is that the same as the bullet above about formalizing a method for the, the three branches to work together? No, it's not. Um, I think we want to check in with the um, tri-branch working group on, we recommend periodically checking in with them on any uh, outstanding or 
new cyber issues. Neither of them are looking at me. <laughs> Kevin's not here. Does, does that seem reasonable? We, we can with? certainly uh, report uh, periodically. Okay, okay. great. Okay, and uh, then here, and this this is where Becky, I'm thinking, uh, putting in, uh, looking at, and I don't know if this is the place, but this is where I'd put it, state level suite of secure services for municipalities. Um, we need to understand, I think, uh, to what level, maybe this is above and not the status of information IT projects, to what extent BGS is offering this already. Um, municipal BGS? service. BGS? Isn't that, yeah, that oh, was. Buildings and general services procurement. Yeah. Oh, procurement, okay. Yeah. Well, and, and maybe we shouldn't limit ourselves because it might come from other places too. Okay. Like agency of Ed or whatever, I don't know. It's just... So we have the list of interactions. So who's providing it, municipal, is this under IT projects? No, I don't think it is. But okay, I think this is going to go up to a bullet. So um, consider, do you want to take a stab at it? Uh, well, it, I'll take a non-specific non wording status. But uh, to me, we want to understand what there is and explore if there are, are you know, opportunities or we should we should think about opportunities for the so-called suite. So, of municipal IT services that would provide greater security to Vermonters and data and, 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 and cost savings, potential savings. Yeah. So it's an it's an explore. It's understand the universe and explore. There's wisdom. Who is that? Is that GovOps? That's GovOps, I think. I think. What do you think? Right. Same result. I'm looking at Karen. Yeah. Sure. I'm glad you agree. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Uh, are there other IT project recommendations that we have uh, looked at here that we should be making? Should be talking about? I think I think the integrated start, eligibility is going to be significant. So, what what's the timeline? I mean, we all have bill drafting requests and stuff. So. What is your expectation of when we send this out? So we talked about committee bills can be Those drafted till like oh, March, okay. right? Yeah. So I think I, if we I'd have to check the deadline, but it's it's yeah. not in December. Yeah. What I would like to do is not meet okay. in December, but I would like okay. to send this to committee chairs okay. before the session, and then mm -hmm. probably again once the session starts. So I'd like us to finalize it. Um, if we need to do that virtually, yeah, uh, I think that's is that okay? That. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. Becky, so and working, we need that. Uh, we'll need to work with JFO on that. Um, and if there are any folks in the audience who have specific um, thoughts they'd like to share now, or so now would be easiest. <laughs> um, yes. We do want question about the bullet point on um, us, which is why in particular would, is the Secretary of State included? We, I mean, it seems the Agency of Digital Services is the Probably entity that's the most relevant for this issue. issue but I think you've it got, was because of elections. You've got taxes, you've got, as we discussed earlier, you've got environmental conservation, you've got okay. all these other so your recommendation Interact. would be uh, ADS and? Well, my recommendation would be led by ADS and, and whoever they feel they need to talk to amongst the other agencies. So it, this is looking at that having, having paying to have an assessment done. Right. So funding an assessment and the parameters of that assessment being yeah. set yeah. by you. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, you and... Uh, ADS jointly. Yeah, I mean that. That's and not the Secretary of State is what you're saying. Well, it seems the Secretary of State is just calling out one particular element I of where we interface with both, with the state. So, 
for so I am not sure if there are other aspects on here that have uh, so Secretary of State has their own cyber security. They are responsible for the security of their systems. That's right. We work, we work pretty closely with them, um, sharing back and forth because they they traverse our network with a lot of their systems. Okay. So do you feel like this is Maybe, that, yeah. that was yeah. adding ADS would be fine. I mean, because there's the treasurer's office, there's Secretary of State's office, there's multiple other So is that all going to be included if we have ADS and the LCT? We can, yeah, we'll make the recommendation and work with those other people to add them in. Yes. If they decide to opt out, I don't have a lot of, I don't have a lot of say. Okay. So I think my last question is that um, this bullet point on the third party assessment is I think the only other one that looks like it is uh, like a direct action that you're asking, um, and it's on cybersecurity. So, I mean, it would take legislation to fund it. So, should this go with the other bullet point on legislation? Yes. Okay. <coughs> John, do you have any ballpark? sense of what that type of an assessment does anybody have any ballpark sense of what that type of an assessment would be no. okay karen do you i, I don't okay. we're doing a network assessment right now or we're going up for bids on a network assessment right now so depending on when those come back um i may be able to give you a Estimate on what that would be to give you a number. That would yeah. be the closest thing. Okay. But it depends on how in depth, if you're talking about particular systems or if you're talking about each application or yep. having assessments done, that's way different than having a perimeter assessment done. Okay. By probably millions of dollars based on the number of applications we have. This would be pretty costly yeah. kind of thing depending on how it's designed, which is why I would lean towards the notion of best practices. And for self-assessment uh, of how the systems that a particular municipality might have uh, fits with good practices for uh, for cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. uh, the, eight, the the part of DHS that uh, did some work uh, for the state is that uh, an organization that might be of help in in in, in this issue in terms of an assessment. Um, we can ask. We were we were moved up on the prioritization list because of a few different reasons uh, for that. But I, I think they have quite a bit of work right now, so I'm not I'm not sure. But we can certainly ask them. Price is right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, that was free. It saved us about 80, I mean. eighty six thousand for that perimeter yeah. assessment. Okay. Does anybody else here today want to offer any specific? <laughs> Um, thoughts on the memo. Okay, so Becky, what I would like to do is um, see when you think you can do a fresh draft of this by. Then I'd like to set a time, a day, for when uh, any suggested edits are to you. Okay. And then, <clears throat> which will come through myself and Senator Brock. Um, as well, um, and then have a final day that the committee will be able to look at this. Okay. So, if we are looking at, do we have a calendar in here? Pull it up. Look at. I'm gonna look on my phone. Are you able to do that, Becky? Um, um I, yeah, I can. That scheduling can here now, or is that yeah, something that you need to send? Yeah, I can send okay. this out by. I'm just thinking if I get it edited. Probably by Tuesday. Great. Okay, so if you send that out by Tuesday, um, and uh, let's make sure that it goes to um, JFO, 
PLCT, uh, Judiciary, Legislative, and Administrative, uh, ADS. And yeah, no, I think that's fine. Um, and then, I'm, so it's coming out of the 19th. You'll send it to us and to those folks. And uh, if we have all edits to you by the 22nd, would you be able to have a finalized before Thanksgiving? So that next week is Thanksgiving. Um, I'm, I'm not in the office. You're not in the office, okay. So uh, December 3rd, anybody yeah, wanna yeah. flag any issues there before December 3rd? Okay. So December 3rd, we'll have a final, and then we will get that out to uh, the speaker of the pro tem and uh, all the, the committees, all, all of the chairs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. Okay. Great. So what exactly are we going to do on December 3rd? Is just simply have the memo. Becky will have it? Becky will have the last draft done. Okay. So we'll email it to us, and yeah. we can all right. sign out. That. Yes. Great, thank you, Becky. Um, that's good. We have two other items. Um, one really quickly um, is uh, committee scheduling during the session. So I feel like we have to meet during the session. Okay, I will. My preference would be to send out a doodle poll of date and time. And I'm guessing that mornings are going to get really competitive. What? Yeah. I mean, the, you're going to run into what we ran into last year. I, yeah. I don't know how we can do it any better than the two of you trying to figure it out. Okay, I mean, if, great, fine. And then and there will be Sarah some Rocks days where the same yeah. misery that I'm in. And yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 You guys have all your. Yeah. Yeah. And then the last item, um, I just want to make sure you all are aware. We've had we have arranged for. Um, you got this. Mm -hmm. uh, Norwich actually brought this forward. Cybersecurity awareness training for officials and senior management. This class is specifically intended for uh, elected officials and others who have to provide oversight for cybersecurity. Uh, it's a four hour class being presented by FEMA, uh, Texas A&M, a number of others. <clears throat> it's going to be offered to uh, legislators and judiciary first. Uh, there are two classes. This is taking place on the 16th. Yep. So there'll be a morning class and an afternoon class. Uh, Mike is going to receive and coordinate all of the RSVPs for this. Uh, Judiciary, I think, may have up to 10 that go, or, you know, I've, I've spoken to the speaker, um, Senator Brock will yeah. speak to the pro tem. Uh, we're hoping to see a decent turnout from legislators, uh, and then we will be offering this to VLCT um, for town, town administrators or folks that, are, um, that have to make decisions. Um, the plan right now is to have Mike send this out to all members on Monday. Uh, with the map, this is at Norwich that this is taking place, um, and then and open it to judiciary on Monday, and then on Wednesday uh, have VLCT come in. So we'll work on the specific. Um, I, I will give you the specific words for that email. So we'll have two days, and our colleagues will have a couple of days to hold head the start. Seat. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And let's make sure that they not send this out for me, though, but. Mike on Monday until uh, we've had an acknowledgement back from the pro tem, because although the speaker has it and is aware of it, the pro tem is not. Right? And and so you'll that make him aware I'll of that, do that today. today. Okay, great. So we're going to get a hold of him. Yeah. I had both of them in here yesterday afternoon. Uh, <laughs> um, any questions on this from anybody? Are and Karen? Both planning to be there? Yes. Yes. I, I, the day. It might be tricky for me, but 
And I think it's a pretty yeah. good opportunity, mm -hmm. um, especially for our colleagues um, mm -hmm. to go. I think it's, I, I personally have been fairly alarmed at what we don't know. <laughs> so. Okay. I, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think that's it. Thank you very much. So we started late and we're ending late. Oh, that's all right. You're off the rest. Okay.